Good morning, everyone attending this wonderful 3D symposium. Today, I am joined by three colleagues who are not only three great individuals, very talented dentists, but really equally, they're great teachers. Our lives have all been impacted by 3D imaging at different parts of our career, and each will explain theirs. Mine began eight years ago, attending a lecture in Chicago, and the course was all about what we were missing in 2D imaging. By the second hour into the program, I knew that if I wanted to offer my patients the best treatment options in clinical care, I had to move into the CBCT world. I knew change would be a bit challenging for sure, but it had to be done. We all hate change, but we have to do it. My specialists were all working in the 3D world and that was my turn. So three weeks later, I was installed and trained. As I look back, this was without a doubt the biggest change in my career via, for di via diagnostics. For the past three years, I've taught thousands of doctors why CBCTs are a must in your practices. Yet at first, let me just say, I thought this was a technology that was really just about implants and then I learned more. And it's far more about advancing your diagnostic approach uh, to what you offer your patients and the superior pathways to better care. It takes out so many of the unforeseen surprises that create stress in our days. Like what kind of stress you can ask? For example, imagine how many times you went and began a root canal, for those of you that do them, and you were surprised at the anatomy or simply the fact that you couldn't negotiate a canal to its full extent. 3D imaging takes that mystery away. And that's just such an aggravating time of a half an hour trying to negotiate the canal you can't or try to find it. How many times have you had to remove an implant crown that was cemented onto a posterior abutment because now you have an open contact and you've got to remove it. Or you had fractured ceramic or a tissue problem and you couldn't find the screw access hole. I've been there so many times. 3D imaging takes this, takes this mystery away because each and every implant as you're gonna hear today, in my feeling is, should be placed with a restorative driven design. A screw down approach in the posterior each and every time. How many times have you seen pathology on a 2D image and wanted more information, happens all the time, or even better, how many times have you seen no pathology and you know something's amiss and you need more information? Today's course is all about these issues and much more. Today, you're going to hear from three GPs. I should have introduced myself. I'm Dr. Lou Graham. You're going to hear from three GPs, yes, GPs and how they have incorporated CBCT into their offices, all from different viewpoints. And where we will really, we'll start with my buddy, Sam, move to my buddy, Chris, and then to my pal, Jeff, who will be closing today, talking about CBCT imaging regarding airway and TMD. I wanna reach out really with a special thanks to Prexion for sponsoring today. It's not a commercial for Prexion, I just wanna say thanks. Their devotion to education is second to none. They've been working with Catapult so closely. For Jeff, Sam, and myself, we were all previous owners of different CBCTs, and we each converted over to Prexion after the company agreed to install their units in each of our offices to compare what we were using. It was without a doubt for the three of us, and I believe our buddy Ron, the most intensive evaluation of our careers. Imagine putting another cone beam in your office. Our experience have been consistent. Our cone beams have great image quality, and that's a key. They've had great support from Prexion, very few technical issues and wonderful training. That said, let me be clear, there are many wonderful options out there in the marketplace for all of you. And today is really about understanding why CBCT imaging will enhance your diagnostic approaches to treatment planning, and without a doubt, enhance your outcomes. So we're going to talk about during the Q&A, money. These are sensitive subjects. How do you bill? What do you do? And I just want to show you what happened yesterday. 
This is my second opinion. So I have a patient come in and I get a lot of second opinions and the previous dentist sent the FMX. And as you look at this FMX, you can see classic perio and severe perio, but do you really see it all? And the patient wasn't getting it. So I did my examination and her chief complaint was tooth number two was very loose. But then she questioned really what was going on. She didn't get it from the first doctor and it didn't connect. She had no pain, had a few other teeth that she noticed were somewhat loose. Like I'll, I'll say a one to a one plus mobility. You'll think when I show you the CBCT, they should have been much more. And she had a bad taste in her mouth. So how do I best explain? I, I usually digitally scan these patients and I always take a comb beam. And to me, what you're going to hear from first with Sam and then Chris, it's all about communication. You put these images up in front of a patient and show them their, their mouth in three dimensions, and this is just a template. You are connecting with each of these patients. And when you look at the severity of bone loss around these teeth, and yet you couldn't see on 2D, really the severity, and you couldn't drive that home, the patient immediately with their first comment said, are those my teeth? And so to me, it's all about diagnostics and communication. Now, with that said, I want to introduce my first speaker. I think today is all about sharing, and Sam is one of the best teachers. It's great to see my friend Sam, and Sam, I'm going to hide my face and mute myself. You take it away, pal. All right. Good morning, Lou, and thank you for that intro. Uh, Lou is one of the best ever at speaking and teaching, and I'm honored to be here to share this with you guys. Uh, I want to thank you all for being here this morning. I think it's um, truly great that you're spending a few hours with us this morning. It just tells me that you're interested in CE and interested in growing your practice and learning more about a technology that you may or may not know very well. I think the three of us are going to share how we would do things in our practice and what we do to make ourselves successful. Um, Lou alluded to it already in that we actually have some different ways of practicing, but we all share the same kind of knowledge and love for technology and what we can do for our practices. I come from San Diego where things are opening up here slowly but surely, and thank goodness we've got the U.S. Open coming up next month. So um, just a quick jaunt about me a little bit here. I've been in private practice uh, for about 25 years now. I just celebrated my anniversary. I've actually, I'm um, also an editor for Inside Dentistry Magazine. I've been a CAD, CAD CAM guy for 2000, since 2004 and placing implants since 2006. We tend to do most things in my office. So um, I wanted to put my contact up there just in case there's anything we possibly don't get to later. I am great by email. I will get back to you very quickly. Um, and also Instagram, if you're uh, interested or do have social media, I'm more than happy to share. I put up some fun things and some dental things in there. No political. We got plenty of that already. So please feel free to join along. I did want to thank Prexion also. Uh, thank you for having these kind of courses, because I think without them, uh, where would we be without education and trying to teach everyone what we know and some of the things that you can learn from people who have had experience with these kind of uh, combi machines and things like that. So if you do have some questions, please do type them in the box. We will go over them, whether it's after my session or at the very end of all three speakers, but please, by all means, type them up. Let us know what your questions are, because I do feel that is the best way to learn is by asking questions and getting your questions answered, hopefully by us. I want to start with whether you're a religious person or not. I think this quote uh, speaks to all of us. Um, I know the coronavirus changed a lot of the ways we practice, what we do, and how we do it in our offices and also our lives. I hope none of you were truly, really affected with family or friends. Um, it affected my office considerably. We were shut down for three months in 2020, um, and I lost over 80% of my team. And I will have to say it was probably the best thing that could have ever happened because the new people that I brought on have actually been much better than what I had before, and we wound up being 20% uh, more productive in 2020, believe it or not, having been off for three months. Makes me think that I should take more time off. But um, 
I hope you weren't too affected by it. And I hope you're growing past it and finding new ways. And I hope you're as busy as possibly can be. And I think some of the reasons is that we started using our CBCT more and, and understanding how to treat our patients and what to do with them. So um, some webinar topics we're gonna to talk about today, we're gonna to try to learn the differences a little bit between 2D and 3D imaging. I'll show you some different things, kind of like Lou started some of his cases, uh, some befores and afters and what we saw and what we didn't see before. We'll also discuss radiation because I know that's important to a lot of you. And um, there's a lot of misconception out there about CBCT radiation and how much more it may be or, or what it is compared to deep 2D imaging. Also discuss, you know, how we use the technology in our office. I think that's really important because we all have offices and they may be different, but we can also learn from other people and take what we like from them. And then we'll discuss the different applications of the CBCT, uh, the different ways you can use it. It's not just for implants. There's a lot more things you can do with it. So we will go through that um, as we go through the day here. Now, um, what I'm going to discuss is the way we do things in my office. Please th don't feel like that's the only way that there is. Please take from it what you like. Modify it to fit your practice in any which way that you like. And please ask questions as how to can maybe fit your way better. Um, I do feel it's important that you learn a little bit about my office and what we do. I am a wet fingered dentist. I practice four days a week. We do have five team members, five now. We also had an associate. I think that's the one downfall of COVID is my associate did get pregnant. Um, so, so the COVID baby thing, I think there's gonna be more than, uh, you, know, you know, the baby boomers, I think there's gonna be COVID babies. That's gonna be the generation that's gonna come up from this year and last year. Um, so that's the one thing we, we have is um, we have a great team now. They're amazing. I can actually truly say that I love my team now, which I haven't said in a while. And I kind of thank COVID for that. Um, overhead's important. I always think of a business background and I come from a business background with my family. I grew up in business since I was 13 years old. I was managing a family business. So to me, numbers are very important. And that's one thing we will discuss in this webinar today. Uh, my overhead's at 56%. Um, I like for yours to be at 70 or below. You should all know how much it's costing you to be open per hour. Um, I will tell you my overhead is that having um, CBCT. We also have all new comb beam. I mean, all new uh, CAD CAM machines. We do, um, we do mill in office as well. I have lasers. So we have a number of things in our office and we're able to maintain our overhead like that. And hopefully I can show you some different ways of using that to help you keep your overhead down. Um, we are in a very competitive environment. My office is in San Diego. There's over 3 million people in San Diego County. There's over 3000 dentists. If you do the math, that's about a thousand dentists per um, doctor. So, and you know that not everybody goes to the dentist. So do we do have to find ways to be different? We got to differentiate ourselves. Um, we don't want to be a commodity. Like a lot of people think dentistry and dentists are basically these days. So I want to share with you a little bit what we do right off the bat with our new patient exams and exactly how we treat patients and what it is that we do once they come in. We always take photos. We're big on digital photos. So every new patient pretty much gets these photos taken on them. Um, even in my hygiene and recall exam, um, I tend to always require that the hygienist put up some sort of a photo. It doesn't have to be something bad in their mouth, but it has to show something. And sometimes it may just be a uh, quick shot of a CBCT of something the patient didn't have done yet, just to remind them of that. And so in the new patient exam, I'll always walk in with this particular picture up and I'll introduce myself and typically the patient's so focused in already on uh, on tooth number six over here and the chip on number eight, but you know, our, my conversation becomes very short. So if you ever wanted to grow your cosmetic business or have patients ask for treatment, put up a photo in front of your screen and have them ask you for it. Um, after you have them ask you for treatment rather than you trying to push treatment down their throat. And I will tell you, especially in California, no matter how white their teeth are, you put them up on a big screen in front of them, they're always going to want to bleach them. So um, this is very important to me. That's one of the ways we treat patients. The other way is we actually use a camera, intraoral camera to show HD quality photos of the patients. We also show fluorescence technology of the patients and transillumination so that we tend to show a complete picture and most accurately really show them what's going on in their mouth. And then it's all brought home by CBCT, which I'll show you in a second. What this allows us to do is really be able to diagnose more correctly and try to get that create that understanding from the patient and the trust factor. 
um, I really believe what they can see, they can start to understand and start to appreciate and then start to actually believe in your treatment and agree to do your treatment with you. Um, these kind of things also allow for better third party payments as well. So we can see a lot of things and show them what they need. Uh, but most importantly, I never was able to see as much treatment as I have until I started using CBCT. You know, we do a 10 by eight in standard mode is typically what we do on most patients. Um, and this can vary a little bit depending on what we're looking at, whether it's TMJ, whether it's for sleep, it can also vary on the size of the patient, things like that. So, but most of the time, the 10 by eight standard picture is the one we use most. Um, once I started using this, rather than just taking an FMX, because to me, taking an FMX used to be our old way. And then we've essentially gone away from that completely. Um, we take a, a cone bean scan and I'll explain to you what we do and, and how we use it and cost and things like that in a little bit. But this tends to give me so much more information and um, I'm able to see so many things while still addressing the patient's main concerns. Um, and having said that, what is our office goals? Our office goals is to turn every new patient into a long-term patient. And with that is by creating trust and being able to give them the comprehensive treatment that they want. And I don't believe I was truly comprehensive until I started using cone beam technology. Um, I, first of all, I'm always asking them, what is their main concern? And we wanna address that first and foremost. But once we see that, then I show them other things that I tend to see in their cone beam, which they may or may not have been aware of. And we really try to make it um, special and different for them. Because one of the things that my front office team always asks is how was your experience? And they always said, like, I was blown away. I've never had, I've never seen my mouth in such a way, and I've never had so much technology shown in one office where I can actually understand what's going on. And that's sort of our goal with every patient, because this helps us grow the practice as well. Um, if you're just a run of the mill, I believe, and just bring them in, take an x-ray, tell them what they need. And a lot of times they don't feel the pain and don't understand why this is happening. Trust factor is not there and you may not get quite the closing in the front that you're gonna to try to get. So a lot of patients may not be doing the treatment that you may be diagnosing in the back. So we spend a little bit of time. When I say we, I will tell you, my team does the majority of this. They're the ones who take the scans. They show a lot of things. I go in there and fine tune a lot of it and explain some of the details or maybe find some of the things. And when I look through it, find some of the things maybe that they had missed. But um, a lot of this is done by my team and it's through practice and being able to show what we know. And really the backbone for us, for our uh, imaging is the radiography. We have to understand how it works and what happens in the office and how we're gonna show our patients. Because the standard hasn't been very good. What's been our standard for all these years? Really, I mean, it's truly been the Explorer. We've hopefully moved beyond that by now because the Explorer was shown many times over by different um, cariologists and different people in the past from studies that it doesn't detect decay very well. It's only 14%. Um, also, some had actually shown that to use it, it causes misdiagnosis and disrupts um, remineralization. So we have to move beyond that. Our second line of defense has always been x-rays, right? So if it doesn't show on an x-ray, it's not a cavity. Well, that's not always been the case because um, again, studies show that they're only 22% accurate for occlusal decay, 52% accurate for an approximal decay. How many times have you had bite wings that are taken by your team and then you don't see the interproximals and how often does that get retaken? To me, that's huge. And by doing a, a cone beam, you tend to eliminate all that because you can go in 3D and take any section you want and look at it in every which way and find exactly what you want with much more detail and clarity. Um, so let's talk about the different radiography that's found in general office. We all know that there's PAs and panoramic x-rays. Um, it's convenient, it's fast, it's inexpensive for the most part, everybody pretty much has them, um, and, but they're only two dimensional and maybe not quite as accurate. So CT, CBT, CBCT, I believe is truly the standard of care and the standard of safety. Um, they are convenient, they're fast. That standard mode takes 7.7 .7 seconds, which to me is, is, is super fast and it takes less than 30 seconds to have it up on every screen in the office. Um, one of the best things about our machine is that it can pull up the information and get it up into the offices, basically by the time the patients made it back to the chair. Uh, and I like that kind of speed because I was recently at an orthodontic office. We're looking at a scan 
uh, of, of my daughter who was seeing this orthodontist. I, I, treating my own family, as you probably all know, is a little bit tough. So I'm actually having her be treated by an ortho, even though I tend to do most things in my office. But it took forever to get a scan up. I kept asking, okay, where's the scan? Let's look at her scan. Come on, let's do this. And uh, to me, speed is very important because when we're in our office, we're moving fast and we've got a lot going on. Um, so we do use a CVCT. We gather the most information I actually truly believe with the least amount of contact, which is really important in COVID days and also to get the most information where we're not sitting there and fighting patients' tori's and different things in their mouths and having issues with them. And it also allows us to give them the least amount of exposure. Um, so let's talk about that for a little bit. Let's talk about radiation dosage because that's, that's really important. And you wanna understand how much dosage your patients get from different things. Um, four bite wings can be anywhere from six to 35 microsieverts. Now on FMXs, they can vary as well. It can be on average from 80 to 150 microsieverts. Then a digital pan can be anywhere from eight to 33 microsieverts. Um, remember these numbers, because I'm going to show you next how much the radiation is with our dosage as we compare here. In a standard uh, 10 by 8 that we take every day in our offices, it's only 78.3. So I'm literally giving them less radiation and getting way more information in the office. So for those of you who feel like, oh, there's a lot of radiation with CTs, that's truly not the case. Also in a rapid mode, if you're gonna take one on a child and wanna see what's going on, 25.2, which is much less than we would if we were taking other types of x-rays on them. Um, to me, it becomes a no brainer because I'm actually radiating less, so it's better for the patient and I'm getting much more information and much more accuracy. So it's a win-win all the way around. And we all know that times have changed. Do you remember the old offices and how things used to look and no gloves and everything? And our offices are really changing and becoming uh, more modern. And, you know, I, John Maxwell said it best. He said, change is inevitable, but growth is optional. Um, I truly believe that we need to kind of ride the wave, if you will, and, and get a hold of change and understand what's happening with it and um, why we want to move along. Because it's going to, the change is going to happen. We just need to get on it and make sure that we're riding the wave and understanding what happens with it and trying to keep up and learn more for our patients to be able to show them better things. Um, what is CVCT? Well, cone beam computed tomography is what it stands for. It's in the European market since 96. It's been in the US market for over 20 years now, since 2001. And I truly believe that it is the most significant technological advancement in aging, in imaging. Now, um, what does it allow you to do? Well, it really lets you be able to diagnose. And I call it the ah and the aha, because you're going to be saying ah to a lot of situations where other people didn't know what was going on. And your patients are just going to be, you know, they're just going to be wowed with this information and what they see on the screen. Um, what are some of the advantages of it? Um, it's the most accurate of information, up to 0.1 millimeter. That's about as accurate as you're going to get right now. Um, this is the ability to be able to place implants, to look at details, to be able to find landmarks, to look at nerve sinuses, to be able to really try and find cracks within teeth, um, look at infections, find uh, anatomy of roots, whether they, you know, whether they split, how many there are, whether there are MB2s. Uh, it really goes into fine detail as to how many things you can find and what is actually happening in the mouth. Um, and it also allows you to superimpose some of these files for those of you that do digital imaging, where you can do these scans and bring your hard and soft tissue together and truly be able to plan. So there's a lot that you can do with CBCT and how it works for our offices and what it does for us. Um, some of you may ask what the difference is between that and panoramic imaging. Well, imagine panoramic imaging basically like having 2D images or letters being superimposed on one another. That typically creates on average about 25% distortion because you're trying to look through these and you're trying to look at them as they're on top of one another. So there is some distortion to this flat image. While with a CBCT, you're actually taking each slice, you're removing it and diagnosing it on its own. So you can really clearly act and accurately see what is going on with it in detail. And the other limitation of this is also it does, you know, what are you seeing? Imagine that the light is the x-ray beam and, and this woman holding a pineapple in her right hand, we can all see that and we would all see that in the image, but then you wouldn't see what's on her left hand, the banana there. Um, that's that third dimension that you miss that we tend to not be able to see a lot of times when we're trying to actually diagnose patients and look at them. 
And do we need all images? I, I think we do. As you can see, the prince here is not being very kind to his royal subjects, if you look at it from a lateral view. <laughs> but if you look at it from an AP view, he's actually not being so bad. So <laughs> I do believe we do need some more views. Now, what do we use day-to-day uh, -day CBCT in dentistry? Where do we use it in our offices and what do we do with it? Um, I'm going to tell you because uh, I do place implants. It's huge for implants, obviously, and you can place them from A to Z. And my colleague, Chris, will be going into that in much more detail. But endo treatment and diagnosis, it's huge for that. I will show you in a few slides here how I look for MB2s. And for a long time, um, so I told you that in my office, we tend to do most, uh, most treatments or stay in our office. One of the things that we don't do is I don't do molar endos because to me, they take too long. And we time every procedure. And if a procedure is taking too long in our office, we will tend to um, send that out, we'll refer it. Or if I feel like a patient's gonna be, you know, taking too long with their treatment and make us take way longer than we need to, that may be something where I may send a patient out. But molar endos is one of those where I don't do them fast enough. So to me, it's much easier to send that out to a specialist and have them do the procedure. But what I do is I'll send them my CBCT and I'll tell them, especially if there's an MB2 canal, Hey, there's an MB2 canal. Make sure you, fin it, you fill it there. My endodontist used to love that until he finally got his own CBCT and said, okay, stop sending me this. I got this. I got this. <laughs> um, I will also show you where we can look at decay and diagnose from it. Um, it's very important for you to see that. And I'll show you axial views where you can actually see very clearly class two decay in there. So there is a lot that we can, we can do with CBCT, TMJ treatments and diagnosis. Um, Apicos, obviously, you can look at a lot of these. Um, impacted teeth as well. I, I tend to do ortho and we tend to look at things every time. We will take a CT scan pretty much on every patient that's going to get ortho. And um, I know Jeff is going to talk about TMJ treatments as well. So I'll, I'll leave that part up to him. He'll talk more about that as well as sleep. But anytime you're doing ortho, I truly believe you need to take CT and kind of go into that and uh, study what the patient looks like and understand that before you get into, before you get too deep into a case. Um, periodontal diagnosis and treatment planning as well. Um, you will see Lou already showed a great case there and we'll show some later about how we go about looking at that and showing patients what they need and making them understand what's going on in their mouth, even though it may not hurt right now. Um, bone grafting procedures, that's an obvious one. Sinus lifts. I will tell you guys also, in case I do forget later, when I have patients that I'm working on them with implants or whether they've done sinus lifts and things like that, um, if we have taken a CT in the past and after bone grafting, I'll typically take another either five by five or maybe another CT just to make sure and see how everything is, especially if there's been a sinus lift that we've done in there as well. And I don't, I don't, I won't charge for that second one, especially. And sometimes we may not have charged for the first one either. And I'll go over that price. I'll go over pricing in a little while. Um, treating airways also. Um, I'll quickly touch one slide where I just show you what, you know, typically what the unit can do in terms of its um, images and figures and leave the rest of that over to Jeff. Um, precise radiographic information is exactly what you're going to get out of this. You'll understand more and you'll be able to show the patient way more. So let me show you a couple of things we're gonna talk about the field of views. That smaller, the one on the left side here, that's a five by five image. This is typically what endodontists will tend to take. Um, if we ever need to just look at a section afterwards, sometimes we'll just take that and see how the patient's doing when it's healing time. But most of the time we're taking the center one where it's complete oral maxillofacial area. That typically gives us most of what we need in terms of our office and for what we use for treatment for diagnosis and a lot of our treatment plannings for the things we do. Um, the large field of view is needed for ortho and reconstructive surgery. So if you're into that and do that kind of, those kind of things, then by all means, absolutely, that's available for you. Um, the anatomical view is really truly an amazing view because in my office, you know, every time we show that, like Lou said, the patient always goes, are those my teeth is the first thing we get from them. Um, and and it's, it's yes, and they look at it and they're just bewildered by it because a lot of times you can look at a case like this and you know, you wanna talk about crowding and you can show pictures of it. And then when you show all the teeth in the mouth and you kind of start talking about that, you say, do you see the crowding in your mouth and you see the bone loss around those teeth? Well, as that happens, you start talking to them about what we can do for them and how we can move some of the teeth in the correct position. 
Um, and sometimes these arches tend to be collapsed or if they've had teeth missing, as in this case, we start talking about expanding the arch slightly and you know, moving the teeth into the right locations and then talking about how the bone loss has affected where everything else is in the mouth. And perhaps we can get some, um, we can do some uh, bone growth in that area and actually get some implants in there so we don't have the teeth starting to continue to tilt and move along. And by straightening this out, how much easier it's gonna become for them to clean and get all the tartar and plaque out and how much nicer it's gonna be for them all together. These are all things that we can show and discuss with them. Um, we can also talk to them about their sinuses and, you know, tell them whether they're clear or not. I had a patient yesterday when we were doing a large case on them. And when I was looking at a CT scan, I saw them, you know, I was asking him, have you had issues with your sinuses? And he said, yeah, he had an implant placed in another office, which I'm restoring. And he said, yeah, I've had it ever since then. Um, and, you know, he talks about it and he's like, and I told him, I go, well, you know, I showed him where the, I, I, I think I don't have it in here. I wish I got, would have gotten it. It was late last night uh, and I already had this presentation done, but you know, he had this implant placed pretty close to his sinus and uh, it looked like it was into his sinus. So we're starting to treat into that and work through that out. Um, but what this allows us to really do is show our patients the need for possible other treatments. Like I said, I always address their main concern first because to me that shows that we're listening to them and it shows them, hey, this person's concerned about me and he wants to take care of the first thing in my mouth. And then I start showing them some of these other things in their mouth and then tell them, you know, we'll talk to them about how they proceed with it and things like that. But this image, this anatomical view can really show a great detail of what we can do. And then we start getting into more specifics. Uh, the axial view shows from top to bottom. Imagine taking slices of your head from top to bottom. Um, it shows great bone volume. It can show decay in different places here. So it can really be um, showing you a lot of different things. It can show class two caries, the anatomical structures. It can show the bone morphology, how much volume you have, how little it is. It can really show the decay and, and, uh, and the different areas of concerns you may have that you wanna show your patients. A coronal view is gonna show you from front to back um, that's going to show you also bone volume in different dimension and some anatomical structures that are really important where the sinuses come into play and where you can see where some of the roots are and where potentially you're going to be placing some of these uh, restorations into the mouth and how you want to work them in there. It's also a great view to show lesions and pathology in the mouth. Um, a sagittal view is basically going from side to side. You're gonna have bone volume showing through again. Um, you're gonna be able to see class two caries in here very easily as well. You can show anatomical structures. You can also show lesions in the mouth. Um, you can look at the bone height and look at the bone volume and it's actual morphology, see what kind of bone you may have and look at different lesions in the mouth with it as well. Um, we talk just a little bit about implants and what I tend to generally do in my office, and that's I do a lot more planning um, nowadays to make the procedure much shorter. Um, you can, you know, plot out your nerve if you'd like, um, place any implant size. The great thing about the software is that it has every type of implant in there, every major type of implant in there, so that you can actually go in and pick out the size and the actual implant that you wanna use and take a look at it within the jaw in different dimensions. Um, and if you find that the bone is not exactly what you want, you can always get a surgical guide as well to help you with that because you can merge these and get guides made for them to make your life truly easy and make implant implants very simple. Um, surgical guides just have made implants such a so much an easier uh, treatment than it ever has been before. But what I always do in cases like this is I spend a few minutes looking at the guide, planning it all out, making sure what we have. That way, the actual procedure winds up being really like a half hour to 40 minutes because we have everything planned. We know what size we're going to use, everything we're going to do. It's just a matter of getting the patient numb, getting the paperwork done and getting it started. And that really allows us to be very efficient and very well in our flow in the office. Um, let me show you some things, and this is what I alluded to before, that I used to send some of these to my endodontist. You know, I would send it to him, and i go, look, there's an MB2 canal right there. You better fill that. <laughs> and like I said, he got pretty tired of it. Eventually, he got his own CBCT. Um, but this was exactly the thing. It makes us sure that this tooth is not going to fail in the future, and it also lets us see the morphology of some of these that have already been done and see what's going on with them and what's going to happen. 
I'm going to show you a couple of cases here in a second. You'll be able to test to that yourself. Um, when you look at the, some of these, you want to know how many canals you're working with, even when you're doing anteriors, for those of you that maybe just do anteriors, you want to take a look at these teeth in multiple dimensions and be able to see that there are multiple canals within even an anterior tooth. Um, I don't want to go into a situation where I'm not prepared and ready to and know exactly what's happening with it. And this allows me to do exactly that and lets me be more efficient and frankly lets me sleep better at night. Um, root resorption is another one where you can see this in different, this is an axial view in the upper left. Um, you can see it in the coronal view here. And you can see it in the sagittal view. And here it is in color where you can truly show the patient what's going on, where they may not notice it, or they may not know anything about this. And you can start talking about root resorption and what the possible treatment and outcomes may be for this sort of a patient. Whereas this may be something that they never thought of. And if you imagine not having this and you just go and tell them, oh yeah, you have root resorption on this tooth. We need to treat it. They're going to look at you like, what, what do you mean? You better be able to show that and make them understand that. Um, where I truly believe this shines, CBCT truly shines is the ability to diagnose. You know, being able to diagnose is an amazing thing and learning more and learning more constantly as we go through this. Um, endo, this is a particular patient that came into our office, said they had been going to their dentist, they went in and, you know, I keep telling their dentist, you know, I'm having pain in this tooth. And even as I look at this PA, to be honest with you, and, and I usually, you know, show this PA and I go, okay, what do you see in this PA? Um, I know there's a large post, but, you know, you don't really see much else. Patients having symptoms, his uh, dentist told him, you know, there's not much going on. Let's wait and see. Um, so when he came to our office, I said, you know, I don't see much in this. Let's take a scan of this and see what's going on. When we take the scan, look at what, what our finding is. Um, it's clear and you can show it to the patient and make them understand exactly what happened. And all of a sudden you look like the smartest person in the room. And all you did was take a scan. And basically, you know, now, now I know this patient's mind for, the, for life, essentially, after having seen this and figured this out. Because all of a sudden they're saying is, hey, this guy has the technology and know-how to be able to figure this out when my previous dentist didn't. So this is a huge thing to do and be able to see. And honestly, I didn't do much. As soon as I looked at the different sides of this tooth, boom, it was clear as day, as you can see. So these cases do come up. Um, here's another one where, you know, you look at this and, you know, you look at the root canal, you know, you see the radiolucency there and you're like, oh, hmm, what's going on with this tooth? Uh, root canal doesn't look terribly bad. You know, you've seen worse. You maybe have seen better. It's slightly short, but what is actually going on with this tooth? Why is, it, why is that happening? And then you go ahead and take a scan and you see that there was a whole other canal that was completely missed. These are some of the things that you wind up seeing and being able to figure out that perhaps others won't and why we see, a, we get a lot of emergency patients and who once we do this kind of treatment on them and look at them and show them what they need, they become patients in our office and lifetimers essentially. Um, impacted teeth, you know, doing surgical planning. I don't know how many of you do ortho. I highly suggest you do some, you don't have to do them all. It's like with everything else with implants as well. Uh, Gordon Christensen had said, general dentists should do 50% of all implants. It's very true. You don't have to do everything, but you should be able to do, you know, half of these. Um, same with ortho. Maybe you don't want to do a case like this, but you should be able to do ortho in your offices. And some of the sim smaller cases that are simpler are pretty easy to do. Uh, but with cases like this also, it allows us to see exactly where the teeth are. What do we want to do with this? We can show the parents, you know, where the teeth are. And sometimes adults, you start to show them where their teeth are hidden, what we can do for them, how we can treat these people. Um, also, I love these showing a third molar assessment here, or just in general to show patients their teeth and they are so wowed by this they look at that they're like wow this is my mouth you know it looks amazing. And then you show them their bite as well and you go you know there's a few things going on so you may address they, they might have come in for wisdom teeth and you can for yourself if you don't like taking impacted wisdom teeth or if you feel like that's too close to the nerve and it's not something you want to deal with, by all means, then you know that, hey, I'm gonna send this to an oral surgeon and not have to deal with it. But if you do like take them out yourself, it's best to know exactly where the nerves are. But on a case like this, you know, the patient had come in for their wisdom teeth. You know, we show them this assessment literally takes like less than a minute to put together. 
And then I show them, look at their bite, look at tooth number 10 here. You start looking at that and you say, okay, well, there's a lot of things going on in your mouth. There's a good amount of crowding, you know, the wisdom teeth are gonna need to come out, but your bite is completely off. And look where your canines are and you're in crossbite and you start showing them models of what the bite should actually look like and where their teeth there should be. And that's huge because then they start to understand, hey, there's way more going on in my mouth. And maybe I'm in the right office now because if they have this kind of technology, you can show me all this. That's the trust factor that you start building and learning in your offices. And I, I believe that's huge and it's made an amazing difference in our offices. Um, you can look at third and fourth molars. You know, for those of you who have been lucky enough, I've seen this twice now in my career, fourth molars. Um, I tell them they have twice the amount of wisdom as an average patient. So, <laughs> uh, but it'll mean it's going to be twice as costly because we're going to have to take out two sets of wisdom teeth. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, it is pretty interesting that you can see it all in detail and look at the bone itself and show them where these teeth are, where sometimes they had no clue what, what was going on. They're like, you know, sometimes I show them things, sometimes it's amazing. And they go, you know, I've had dentists forever. I've been going forever. You just showed me things that I've never, ever seen before. I love it when I hear that because I'm like, okay, well, I'm actually teaching them things and showing them things that are things that they never thought about or haven't really uh, done too much with. Um, I told you I would mention the airway diagnostics and, and here's a little bit of what this can do in your offices because uh, the Prexion technology actually has this in every single unit that you can go in and map out the airway. And um, I won't go into too much because I know Jeff's probably gonna speak a little bit about it. But um, this is one factor in, in looking at sleep apnea and some different things from it. It allows us to see the airway um, and be able to have that conversation with the patients. Like I said, it's one factor. So, you know, those of you who do airway and, and um, don't, don't go, you know, too crazy because it is just one and we have to have other determinants and look at other things. But it, this program does show you that. And it does give you the ability to be able to map out the airway and see where it is and how a patient looks. And maybe if you have a start into that conversation down the road of airway, which we typically do in my office. Now, let's do a little case study here because this one's kind of an important one. It's pretty great because um, this is a 45-year-old female that presented for a new patient exam. And basically she came in with my lower tooth hurts. Isn't it great when they come in for the tiniest little thing or, you know, and they're like, oh, then my tooth. And then you look at the mouth and, um, you know, I don't need to tell you, most of you are dentists on this call, but just looking at this, there's gonna be a few things involved in this mouth to say the least. Um, just look at the perio, you know. Um, and that's just from this picture. We haven't even gone into anything yet. Um, and so, you know, she's very nervous. She comes in and, and, and she's a talker. She's a type A personality and she's just going, she's in furniture sales. And, um, you know, she says, I'm having a toothache pain and, you know, you got to help me out because I, I can't work like this. And I said, all right, well, let's take a look. Um, here are some of our other pictures. Just by looking at some of these, you start to get an idea of what is happening in the mouth and what is going on there. There is a lot more involved. Um, so I tell her one of the funny things is as you see these massive tori that she has, and I told her, let's take a scan of this, you know, and take a look at what we need. Um, she says, oh my God, you're not going to put that thing in my mouth because that thing cuts me. And that's one of the reasons I hate going to the dentist. Every time they take an x-ray on me, they put that little thing in my mouth. She's talking about the sensor, obviously, and they kill my, the inside of my mouth. And I said, no, we're not going to take that. We're going to look at a couple other things today. So we took a scan. Um, and just looking at her scan, you know, we take a look, you can manipulate this any way you want. You can look by quadrant. You can look at the whole mouth. Um, I love looking at the axial view here because this tends to show you a lot. It can show you decay in the mouth. Um, you can scroll up and down this and look at different levels, different slices in the axial view. Um, you can see what's happening down there in her tooth, though, that she's talking about. There's some huge decay here, but there's also decay in other places. You've got a fractured tooth here. So I obviously address this tooth and talk to her about this tooth because that's the important feature to her. And that's, a, that's a, the reason she came in. So we discuss the need for a root canal in this tooth, but I also tell her, you know, there's a couple other things going on in your mouth. Uh, besides the perio and everything else that my hygienist has gone through, she's gonna go through and she's gonna see this. I'm gonna show her all these different lesions, these broken teeth, these different things in her mouth. And we're gonna discuss these. And I'm gonna start to talk to her about, you know, I show her, 
her uh, anatomical view here and ask and talk to her about how her teeth are sticking out. And then, you know, she starts to tell me, you know, I, I'm in sales and I hate the way my teeth look because they're stick so far out. And so that starts up the conversation about aligners and ortho. She doesn't want braces, obviously she's in sales, but we start talking about aligners, about moving the teeth in the right location. And then we start talking about some of the spaces in her mouth and, and you know, what we can do in some of those areas. So these teeth don't continue to move and continue to lose bone. Um, she has a ton of bone loss, a lot of perio in her mouth. Um, we talk about getting her mouth cleaned up. We talk about removing the decay. Obviously, her first thing that she's going to do is she's going to be going to an endodontist and having that tooth treated. And then what we're talking about is restoring that and starting to clean up the mouth. And then we, we've actually got her now, and she's in Invisalign now, where we started to move her. And she's actually sent six patients since we've seen her to us. She says every time a patient goes in to get furniture, she shows them there and she talks about her teeth, shows her Invisalign off to them, and then talks about what a great job we did and sends patients to us. She's been an amazing referral. And where did this all come from? Because I took a little bit of time showing her what's going on in her mouth after addressing her main concern and then showing her the different things that we can do. Um, she was diagnosed by the time we were done for over $30,000 in treatment between implants, Invisalign, and everything else we need to do. And she is just sending patients like the best referral source we've had in a long time. So, you know, as we continue through, my idea is, so why, I, people always ask me, why do I need the technology today? To me, it's very simple because you want to evaluate your patients. And that's huge. We got to evaluate the patients and see exactly what they need. Address their main concern first, but then go ahead and show them the other things that they need. Fully diagnose and be able to show them that. Um, one of the things that I didn't say, and I say to every patient at the end, once I show them everything, I tell them, I'm going to give them a game plan of what I saw. And I also tell them that my job is to show them what's going on in their mouth and to truly show them what is actually happening and what can occur in their mouth. They can do what they want with that information. They can do some of what I say, all of what I said, or none of what I said, and that's up to them. And they can proceed in any speed that they want. But my job is to show them what's happening in them and let them make an informed decision about what's going on in their mouth, because I believe that's truly important. Um, then others might say, well, you know, why should I get a CBCT? And there's always different things about it. Dr. Cost is one of the main ones. Yes, these units aren't cheap, but I will tell you, um, you will see more treatment and be able to diagnose more dentistry than you've ever seen before once you start using a CBCT. Um, patient cost is an important one. Uh, in my office, we tend to, I don't always charge a CT scan fee. I, to be honest with you, I rarely charge that fee. Most of the time we charge it as a pano on new patients. Um, so, you know, $105, $120, things like that. It's fine with me. The cost of the CT to me means nothing. The more important thing is let's be able to show them the treatment that they have, make them a lifetime patient. And then that, that will more than pay for what the monthly financing cost is of a CT machine. Um, doctors are always concerned about learning curve. And I always tell them, you know, learning curve is simple, but what I want you to understand is if I was to put a new composite, let's say in front of you and, and have you do a class two, it may look okay the first time you do it. In 30 days after having used it for a while, you're gonna be much better when I see that 30 days later. It's the same with C CBCT. You'll learn to read them, you'll learn things. And every time you learn something new, it's gonna be gaining knowledge in your head and you're gonna remember it for the next time. So. Those are three important factors and space is the last one. I used to not have any space for this. Originally, way back when I had to send patients to labs or have the trucks come into my parking lot. And that was a nightmare. Either the patient was late or the truck was late. Uh, eventually we made a little bit of space. We had our first unit in there. And then eventually I went to Prexion and this is my second Prexion unit that I have in my current office right now. Um, in our office, just to go quickly so I don't take up too much more time here as we go. Um, we use monthly AdWords. Um, I have a company that does our Google AdWords and uh, we offer complimentary CBCT. Like I said, I don't mind throwing that in a lot of times um, to get patients to move forward to treatment or to be able to show them that. It attracts more implant patients a lot of times. And once they're in, they see the technology and I make them understand what's in their mouth. Um, I've never had a single implant patient come in and just need an implant and that was it. So to me, it attracts the patients and brings them in. Um, if the patient can really understand and clearly see what the, what's going on in their mouth, I really believe they participate in the treatment and our closing percentage winds up being closer to 90%, which is very high in the industry. 
Um, we average about 20, 30 scans at least a month. So the financing of the payment is easily covered. And even if it's not, honestly, the treatment more than covers that. So that's not a big thing for me. Um, so that's how I gauge my, my investment on CBCT. It's more by the amount of treatment that we're doing and um, how my staff handles it and how they understand it too. It's important to get the staff trained too. And they do a great job of training your staff as well as yourself. Um, marketing, I won't go into this too much as I'm kind of running into my time here a little bit, but we do a, a great deal of, um, a, this thing is always your own patients. You have a ton of patients in your office, start to use the technology on them and you'll be able to see so much more. Uh, we also we use Weave for communication and um, maybe in the end, we can talk a little bit more about this marketing as I usually go into this in detail. Um, so I'll finish with this. A mind once expanded can never return to its original dimension. I hope I've expanded your mind in some way in terms of how we use the technology in our office, what we do with it, um, not just for implants, not just for sleep, not just for TMJ, but in general, how we use it on an everyday basis and what we tend to do with it in our offices. And here is my information. Like I said, if you have other questions at the end, I'm more than happy to um, share with you later if we don't cover it by the end of the webinar series here. And I'll get Lou back in and I'll end my share here. So can I ask a few questions? Absolutely. Okay. So I think I wanna highlight some things and then of course I'll bring Chris on. So I think one of the key things here is that whether Tori or not, it takes only seven seconds to take a standard scan versus an FMX and all the retakes. So the first question that most people ask us is when do you read the scan during an initial exam? And while and when you're reading it, what's going on with the patient while you're reading the scan? Tell me your answer on that. So in my office, once they come in and uh, my staff goes in to take a scan, then they're going back into the room, taking their photos. So while they're taking the photos, typically I'm trying to look at it. If I'm not, hopefully I'm not with another patient, but we kind of try to plan this to where I'm going in and looking the scan in detail and kind of getting an idea of what's going on in their mouth. Um, also, a lot of times I've gotten my, my team to go in there and really learn some things. And sometimes they're going to highlight things and they're going to come hit me with some of the things they've actually looked at if I'm with a patient or something else in the room. Um, so I'll, I may come into the room and my, my assistant or my hygienist, depending on who takes it. One of the things I didn't mention, Lou, is we're not very particular. Like I'm not totally insistent and I have to see the patient first. If they want to come through hygiene, they can come through hygiene. That's fine in my office. Um, but my hygienist or my assistant will come through and they'll say, hey, doc, this is what we got. Here's the scan. Here's her main area of concern. This is what I looked at. Um, this is a tooth. And she's already pointed out some of these things and has them on there. And I'm sitting there showing the patient that. And then what I'll typically do is I'll go through that axial view and just kind of pick that apart right in front of the patient. And I'm showing them and detailing it out to them. As I'm working on my computer, they're looking at it on the screen right in front right. of them on the large screen. So they're able to see everything I'm doing and understanding it as we go through. And a lot of the times my assistant or hygienist have taken the photos, they've taken different things. So we wind up bringing this all together in about a you know 10 minute presentation from my end. Yeah, and it's interesting. I think, and we'll hear from Chris, I think we all do it in our own way. Yeah. But I, I would say like when I'm reading the cone beam, my assistant's taking vertical bite wings routinely and often taking a digital scan so I can prepare my presentation, just like you're doing with digital photos, et cetera. I think a caveat, and I think you would agree, when we're looking at caries, it's easy to identify caries in patients who don't have a lot of metal in their mouths. Yeah. When, when they, I think it's a, an important point, Sam, that we tell yeah. everybody, because when people have implants and crowns and bridges, evaluating decay, we really need traditional bite wings. Your thoughts? Yeah, and absolutely, we take them too. So there will be four bite wings taken, especially on patients like that. You know, if their mouth is pretty clean and there's not much in there, then this Agreed. is a slam dunk. You know, it's we don't need to do any more than that. Yeah. But if they do have that, absolutely, you need some of those bite wings and you got to make sure they get the contacts just right too. So, yeah. so yeah. An another point you brought up is endo referrals. So, I think one of the huge advantages for us and for our patients is routinely 
when I'm referring endo out, I'll make a copy on a USB drive of the patient scan like you do. Mm -hmm. And I think we're often saving the patient a consult. They're going for treatment and that saves them money. What are your thoughts in time? Oh, absolutely. I meet consults. I've spoken with my endodontist. I'm like, we don't do consults. When I send them there, right. tell me for treatment. Let's not waste time and have an appointment. Then you make them another appointment. No, no, no. They're coming to have treatment done and that's it. Here's all you need. And if you want to take what you need to, but you're treating them that day. Let's not sit here and make the patient go back and forth. So I, absolutely. Yeah. I, I think these are just key points when people are going, what's the value of a scan? It's a huge value to our patients. Okay. One last question. Okay. When you take a scan on teenagers or kids in their twenties, and I look at them as kids today, do you routinely, and we'll talk about it just a brief few, a, a minute, do you usually do a rapid scan on those patients, which is only a couple seconds and less radiation, or do you normally take a standard scan and looking at caries and a little bit more detail? I'm curious in Sam's world, what does he do? Yeah. So, you know, this was one that we worked on with a team. So sometimes you'll get some, and I, I had a, so you say this like that, and I've had a 19 year old come in and they, don't, they won't smile and they open up their mouth and the entire mouth is blown out. But the majority are people that we probably just do a rapid scan on and maybe four bite wings and that's it. And right. For that age group, you know, right. that's, the, that's why I say you kind of judge them based on patients. And that was the thing when we had first started trying to get the team all on board on exactly who's going to do what. And if they have questions, I'm always there for them to come ask me, what do you think? Which one do you right. want? Hey, you know what? That's a young kid. Mouth looks clean as far as you're concerned. Take a rapid, take four bite wings. We'll go from there. And, and I think it's important for everybody to know that, when you're looking at buying a machine, you've got to be looking, Sam, at the different fields of view. One field of view is definitely not enough. Yeah. And I also think the, you know, the, the, the kind of scan, whether a rapid scan with less radiation for kids to a standard scan, which is less than an FMX, to higher definitions, I think doctors have to understand what are their needs when they're purchasing versus just buying a one or two field of view and getting a standard scan. I think having those options is critical. Your final thoughts on that? Absolutely. And, and there are times, like I said, I will even take a second scan on patients that we do sinus bumps and things like that on where I'll actually just go in and take a little five by five of that area where I don't right. have to do the whole thing. And again, that's one where I, I throw it in and we're not charging for anything for that because I want to make sure my we have yeah. that position and we're ready to move on with treatment. Yeah, Sam, I agree. Like when I opened the course today with that patient who came in with the FMX and I wanted to really show her, I didn't charge her for that comb beam. She just paid for an FMX and I, I want the work. I, yeah. I want to I share the knowledge. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. It's the gold at the end of the tunnel. You yeah. don't sit there and get nitty picky on, oh, I'm going to charge you for this or we're not going to do this. It's, right. oh, that stuff is, yeah. That's great. Okay. And now I'm going to introduce my buddy, Chris from Wisconsin, who I heard years ago at Arrowhead. He's one of the best teachers in dentistry. I'm so excited to share him with everybody here. Without a further ado, Chris, take over. Thank you, Lou. The, um, the hard thing about this presentation is following a guy like Sam. Um, I generally like to have the junior varsity play first, but when you've got varsity going first, it, it, it can make it difficult. I want to welcome all of you again. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Um, thank you for the, um, the time that you're allowing us. It really is a, a pleasure to be able to do this. And I also want to thank Prexion. Um, as Sam mentioned, this is not an inexpensive item. And without education, we can't make a, a decision, uh, an informed decision on a purchase like this. And, and so thank you to them as well for the, this sponsorship. What I wanted to talk about today is um, especially because Sam has talked so eloquently about diagnosis and patient information is what we do to 
if we need, what we do to create an alternative treatment plan and how we develop that treatment plan. And this is all based on um, my series of indiscernible dentistry. Um, what is indiscernible dentistry? That is making artificial anatomy appear like natural anatomy. There's a, there's a joke about what's the difference between God and a dentist. God doesn't think he's a dentist. And sometimes we think we can do things that are just really difficult in making them indiscernible. But one of the technologies that helps me do this is 3D imaging. I cannot work today without 3D. It allows me simply to do more. How? Because as Sam talked about, it enhances the diagnosis. It enhances our treatment plans. And so importantly, it enhances our outcomes. So what I want to do is talk about a case, a case that walked into my office and and I'm, I'm proud to be a dentist that specialists refer to. Um, obviously, it is typically in a different fashion we send to them. But when they see the type of care that can be provided, the type of outcome that these patients have, we have specialists referring to us. And so this happens to be a referral from an orthodontic patient or an orthodontist, and she is in orthodontics. And she says, Doc, the, so the orthodontist writes me a letter and she says, dear Dr. Stevens, Kelly has a history of cleft lip and palate and congenitally missing seven and 10, been in treatment for 14 months. Could you please evaluate the space for implants on seven and 10? Now this, this young lady has a general dentist, has a dentist that, may restore implants, may not, but yet at some risk, potentially, she's referring her over. She says, the upper midline centered, okay. Um, the oral surgeon has already done a bone graft in the number 10 area, and he's gonna be placing implants. She's also missing the right lateral incisor and, and, and primary tooth D is still there. So before I, the orthodontist, refer her for implants, I wanna make sure that you like the spacing. Can we have an appropriate space? Or do, I, do I as an orthodontist have the appropriate space for golden proportions for these two lateral incisors? I had sent her to a prosthodontist, but she was dissatisfied with that experience. Um, the prosthodontist said, hey, you know what? We can just spread out eight and nine, do a little bonding on there, and we should be good to go with the space that's there. So they wanna hear my thoughts and she's gonna go to college. And so we're on a timeline here, okay? So I bring Kelly in and here she is. So you can see that she's in full band and this is a primary tooth. Um, the cleft here on that left side. And again, the prosthodontist said, sorry, the prosthodontist said, let's, that, that space for seven and 10 is a little wide. Instead of bringing the posteriors forward, let's just distalize the centrals, do a little uh, diastema closure, and we'll have an appropriate space. And they wanted to do nothing to those front teeth. So um, they were they were concerned about that recommendation. And here is a portion of her occlusal view. So what I did, much like Sam does, is I took photographs immediately because sitting with a patient with a mirror in their hand and an observer, her mother, sitting in the room, I'm, I can't have them laid back, mirror in their face, mother trying to see, assistant retracting, me pointing, it doesn't work. So we take these photographs and I put them up on the monitor in front of the patient. And so we can discuss this um, as a community. 
so all right i don't know um really what's going on yet only how they have presented and so we have this nice discussion and mom asked me a very difficult question one that i was very uncomfortable with she says do you place implants and my first thought is oh geez the oral surgeon is ready to place the implants now I'm going to place them and am I stepping on toes? Should, um, should I lie and say I don't? Should I tell them, yes, I do, but I won't because you're already with the oral surgeon? But our philosophy is that we do not choose the patient. The patient chooses us. And we choose them if they choose us. So my answer was simple. Yes, I place implants. The next question, can you do the implants? And one answer that I use routinely is, I don't know. Why don't I know? Because I don't have enough information. I can't tell them whether I can place these implants right now. So I say, I don't know. And, and I, I really believe what that does is brings us down to the same level that I don't have all the answers, but I have a method of getting more answers. So I said, I don't know, let's do this. Let's take a scan and let's take a look at what bone is there. Now, this is a free consult. I want low fee coming into the practice this patient comes in looking for some answers. I don't want to charge them for answers. I want to create an experience. So now they're coming in for a free consult, but in order to answer, in order to answer the question, do you place implants? I need a scan. All right, let's do this. Let's take a scan. Well, how much will that cost? You know what? We really need the information to move forward there's no fee for. And what I think that does is also helps tie the patient to the office. They are, they feel that this is such an important piece of information that this office has that I'm going to stay put. So we take the scan. And this is the number seven area. And what you see there is the remnants of the deciduous lateral incisor with a bracket on. And you see that we have adequate bone height, but the bone width is very narrow. So the one, one thing that I really love about CBCT is there is no magnification. It is a one-to-one -one relationship. Even when you zoom in, it stays a one-to-one. -one. So the green line is the length of the bone, and that's at 13.85 millimeters. But the width is only 3.47 or three and a half. So we really are diminished on bone volume and would probably need a lateral ridge augmentation in that area. We go to the other side and this is what we see. This is where the cleft was. Now this little burst here is the arch wire. So that's where the, se the center of the lateral incisor should be. But the bone is up here. And remember, this is post graft. So when the orthodontist said the surgeon's ready to place the implants and she's gotta be done by fall, I'm not so sure that's possible. In fact, I'm quite sure that it is not possible. And the magnitude of this picture was that they understood that implants were not going to be possible here. We can't get that type of bone height. So what I did while they were here is I did what we term and our patients love, I said, let me do virtual surgery on you. 
I want to place an implant virtually to see how it would look. Can I do it? And so this happens to be a Stroman implant, a 3.3 millimeter implant. And I measured where I wanted the platform based on where the arch wire was. And you can see how deficient that bone is. Now, obviously, I placed it to the lingual only so that they can look and compare the virtual implant against their bone. And now they understand that implants are not possible. We cannot do an implant in that area. So what do we have to do now? What are our treatment options? We came in thinking all we're going to do is talk about implant restoration. Now we move to not only is that not possible, but placement of implants not possible. And so I come up with, I have, I'm in charge of coming up with an alternative treatment plan. Well, what is a treatment plan? Certainly we're not going to hang on to the deciduous lateral incisor. You saw that there was no root there. So what are the options? Well, we're not going to put her into a removable partial denture, not at age 17. So we think, well, do we do some sort of bridge work? Now, with the advent of zirconium and, and adhesive dentistry, we could do a unilateral Maryland. Do we hang it off the canine number six and and have seven as the unilateral cannel, cantilever, or hang it off 11, have 10 as the unilateral cantilever, hang it off eight and have seven as the unilateral cantilever. Same with nine, do a three unit fixed bridge either side. So it becomes now a lot more involved in treatment decisions. So our first thought, of course, was we're going to have to do some kind of a bridge. So, but the question is, how do we know we can do the bridge? So let's look, and thank you, Sam. Thank you for demonstrating the different views that are possible in CBCT. And one of the views he talked about was an axial view, a top down or a bottom up view. And so this is the maxillary arch. This is the left side here as indicated by the L and the R over here. So we are superior to the lateral deciduous canine. And, and we are into that level of bone that you saw that diminished level of bone. As I go more superior apically Look at number nine. Look at the loss of bone around the number nine. And as I go further superior, look at the continued loss of bone around the number nine. So now I'm very concerned about tooth number nine, the left, la the left central incisor even being an abutment for a bridge. So I'm feeling at a loss. I'm feeling at a loss. They are concerned. I'm not sure which direction I can go right now. And you see the problem here really is that they didn't like that one of the options was to spread these two teeth out a bit and restore the implants. They want to leave these teeth where they are. And now I'm worried if I can even save this tooth. Can I save that tooth? Can I use it in the restorative process? And if I can't, how do I tell this young lady that not only are you missing two teeth, but I'm gonna take one more. And then as I continue down that path, if number nine is missing, 
goes number eight. What purpose does that serve? Do I have to do a six unit bridge from six to 11? And if I do, I certainly don't want an intermediate abutment. So now I'm gonna tell this nice little lady who's already had physical and emotional challenges because of a cleft that we're not gonna spread out your two teeth. We're gonna take your two front teeth out. These are, these are very emotional discussions that I can't make without logic, without information. So they saw this and they're concerned. They can compare the bone here and the lack of bone here. So what is their question? Well, what can we do? What is my answer? I don't know. But let me do this. Let me take some time while you're away to figure this out. And then we'll meet again to propose a solution. So we don't have to have the answers immediately. But when I tell people that I'm gonna take time while they're away, it engages them further to the practice. So that's what I decided I had to do. So I went to an oral surgeon who spent 10 years at Rush Memorial Hospital in Chicago as a cleft surgeon. And he said, Chris, I took the CT, the digital photos, and I said, Eric, help me out. What can we do? And he says, Chris, I believe there's enough bone on nine to use and as an abutment for a three unit bridge. He says, obviously that lingual apical defect goes into the cleft, but fortunately a natural tooth requires less bone. He said, if we extract nine or, um, or extract seven, uh, D, sorry, um, and do an implant, he says, it's, um, much less predictable. The outcome is much less predictable. He said, we could bring nine down to level out the tissue. I would have to do a subnasal graft. Um, and at the time of the extraction, hopefully there's enough bone to place a three and a half millimeter implant. Okay, um, this seems like a lot, but I'm starting to think about a bridge. So if an implant, option is chosen, we're going to super rep nine, we're going to do subnasal grafting, we hope that we have enough bone around, place an implant, we're going to cantilever 10 off nine, the implant, we're going to hopefully have enough bone. We still have to deal with eight because there's a restoration on nine and eight and nine are hard to match. So that really the bridge is the best option, most predictable. I've seen many cleft individuals with similar or even worse supporting bone on an adjacent tooth and they've lasted many years, okay? So I say, let's go to a bridge. So this is a different individual. This is an individual who came to me um, as a teenager obviously missing seven and 10. She had deficient bone in seven and 10. Had an oral surgeon do lateral augmentation, lateral ridge augmentation, it failed. I sent her to a periodontist to have lateral ridge augmentation, it failed. I sent her to an implant specialist for a third lateral ridge augmentation, it failed. And we couldn't do implants. So what I'm doing here is I'm consulting with Callie and her mother about options. And I'm using a patient to do that. This patient is in the same predicament as Callie. You see Callie, here is the orthodontic retainer she wore. You can see the wires on the back there. This is 
what we call a flipper. She just takes it in and out and it's a temporary device to help give her a smile while we're managing her case long term. And what we had to do with two bridges, we have a bridge from six to eight and a bridge then from nine to 11. And you know what happened? They start crying because what I have done for them is provided hope. Hope that there's a solution, there's an answer. And so having these cases to demonstrate to other individuals um, is a great benefit to the patients that present themselves with their own set of concerns. Now, one thing that is, I think, terribly understated in dentistry is prognosis. Dentists don't talk about prognosis. And I think it's self-inflicted. We expect things to last and we have trained the patients to think things will last. But I went into prognosis, long-term prognosis to a great degree with Callie and her mother. Because I said, we don't have other good solutions than a three unit bridge on either side. But you are aware of the bone around the left front tooth. Now I've talked to a, a cleft surgeon and he says, we don't need as much bone, but still you don't have as much bone as we'd like. You saw how deficient it was. But he's talking about that he's seen patients with this lasting for years. So they know that if this fails in 10 or 15 or 20 years, it's not my fault. It's the environment she presented with. Physicians do this wonderfully. And frankly, I learned this by doing TMD patients. The reason I'm so successful in TMD patients is because I bring patient expectation down to my ability. They think they're in a dental office and they're going to get fixed. Medicine doesn't do that. I don't think we should either. And so I really had a wonderful discussion about what's long term for Cali. We expect years, but we don't know. Do you want to go ahead? And so we've reset patient expectation. And I think that's very helpful. So now she's debanded. We're going, she has a low smile line. So I'm not worried about the asymmetry and the gingival heights of eight and nine. There is the primary lateral and I'm gonna prep four teeth. Okay. I don't like doing this because I've committed Callie to a lifetime of dentistry at a very young age. She will have to deal with this bridge for a lifetime. But the years that this could give her will be significant. So we're taking our pre-treatment shades, I did a little, I have a CO2 laser. I did some laser recontouring on the eight. We take our prep shade, send in these photos to the lab and I use iTero. So these are the digital scans of the preps and you can see that the primary lateral is still there. I didn't want the bleeding of the extraction of the primary lateral to negatively impact the impression. So I left it in place, impressed it and then told the lab to extract the tooth off the cast. Okay, so here are the itero impressions. So now we're going to do a try-in, and one thing that you notice is that they're short. All the margins are short, and the reason for that is we're ovating the pontics into the tissue. I'm going to shove these pontics into the tissue as much as possible so that it appears obviously that that lateral incisor is coming right out of the tissue. So we try it in. We're thrilled with the shape, the color. We've got the okay from Callie and her mother. Okay. 
Okay. So there are the preparations. You can see the uh, immature healing on the primary lateral. Um, we're going to bond this. I happen to be a big believer in rubber dam isolation. So we place our rubber dam isolation, seal off the pallet. That way I can have wonderful moisture control and retraction. Okay. And here is Callie. Now she's, these are seated. So yes, she does have somewhat of a lower smile line, especially on that left side. But if we retract her, here's her care. And you can see that we have brought those lateral incisors up into that tissue. Um, and she is absolutely thrilled. How long will this last? I don't know. I truly don't. But over time, if it fails, they understand why. It isn't because I did or didn't do something. It isn't because I did something wrong or didn't do something I should have. We're concerned about the bone around the left maxillary central. Okay. Now, Again, we've committed her to a lifetime of dentistry, but the impact this had was tremendous. My wife told me once, you need to get in touch with your feminine side. Well, I think I've gone too far because Callie's crying, mother's crying, my assistant's crying, and now I'm crying. Because this is so emotional for this young lady. What if I did this in 2D and didn't know that lingual bone was missing? And then this fails. Do you think without prediction of that potential failure, without understanding that there is limited bone on that central incisor, they would have come back to me. And I would have had to explain why it went wrong if I even knew. You know, some people call it informed consent. I say it this way, predict the potential rather than excuse the result. And there is potential she'll lose this. I don't know when, but at least they know and we've given them some wonderful years of a great smile. So we're very pleased in how this turned out, as are they. Okay. It, it really, um, it exemplifies indiscernible dentistry. But I can't do it without technology. Another piece of technology I have is something called the T-scan. And you all know what T-scan is. It's the same sensor that Dr. Scholes has in Walmart where you step on and look at pressure points. So I get this letter from the orthodontist and says, hey, um, wow, Kathy's teeth look beautiful, but I wanna get your thoughts about the bite. Normally I want anterior contact, but I am concerned about the force on nine. And so even the orthodontist understands that there is, there is complications with that bone. So she says, I placed the brunt of the force on the posterior. Do you think I have too much force on the cuspids? So what I do is I have her in and I do a T-scan. So it's a bite, a computerized bite wafer with 1200 cells that are activated by force and tell me at what time to a hundredth of a second that force is activated. And we can see by this, there's 11 and there's six and the primary force is on the first bicuspids. So I'm thrilled with this because we don't have force on the anterior teeth, the eight and the nine, and we have greater force distal to the canines which means my bridge on the distal abutments is also protected.
I really, I really rely on this technology and not just a technology. You know, um, Sam and Lou were talking about costs. I don't. I don't in this regard. I think of value. What is value? Value is benefit minus cost. If the benefit to the doctor outweighs the cost, there's value. And that's what I found in CBCT and T-scan, laser. The cost was not important because the benefit was so great there was value. And I and talk to patients about that when they ask about cost too. I say, I want you to think about, will this benefit you more than it will cost you? So we talk, I, I talk to my patients the same way that I think about cost. So to me, the cost of CBC is nothing relative to the benefit and thus the value. So, um, Lou, I'm sorry. I'm done about a few minutes early. So we're gonna ask you to do um, a little song and dance to fill in my time. But I really, um, I really want people to know that we can create such natural looking dentistry if we have the right tools the right training. When we have the right tools, it is so much easier to create an environment that the patient appreciates. So thank you. So, so Chris, and <laughs> a lot of warmth in that presentation and very unique, I, I might add. So let me ask you this. How often do you feel that as a general dentist, we're put in a position with these kind of technologies, often as a second opinion, even when specialists have been, you know, given their opinions. I think in the past, oftentimes the specialists dictated to the general dentists. And I think our path forward is the general dentists have to be equal to or more openly because we honestly are treating the outcomes. So I'm curious as to your thoughts, but I find the issues come up more often than not. If we look at, for instance, just the implant world, who's responsible for the outcome? Because it really isn't the surgeon. It is us who restores it. And if something fails, they're gonna to look to the person that treated them last, first. I believe that when we have these types of technologies that we can provide as good or better care than the specialists, especially because we are treating the case from start to finish. I don't, I don't like to think of myself as a control freak, although I like control. And I relinquish control to the specialists if I don't have this type of technology to allow me to move forward with an anticipated outcome. So for me, it became glaringly obvious that I needed to do more cases start to finish. And I, I could do them as well or better than the specialist because I knew what the outcome was where oftentimes, as you remember in early in the implant world, they were just placing implants where there was bone, not necessarily where the restoration needed to be. And I, I wonder sometimes, you talked about it, Lou, a top-down philosophy. Who drove that? Was it the general dentist that drove top-down? 
because they weren't getting implants where they needed to be. And so I think that, I think that there is so much more information that general dentists need to have. And the wonderful thing is that it's available. Yeah, and, and to that point, Chris, I, I just think for every viewer here, the amount of power that is in CBC technology that allows you to ultimately know outcomes before treatment and what options those are. I think, Chris, like you said, the benefits outweigh any possible cost. And costs, of course, we got to pay our bills. But the benefits, just knowing the potential outcomes, are, are that's why I say this was the greatest shift in my diagnostic career in dentistry. Absolutely. And you know, one of the issues that I had before technology, and I even, um, I, I don't like admitting it, I was doing hope dentistry. Yeah. Jeez, Agreed. I hope this works. I hope this lasts. Yeah. I hope they like it. I hope, I hope. And Billy Graham filled stadiums offering hope. We need to offer hope to our individuals, but for us, having hope that our care works is a very uncomfortable feeling. Right. And technology has diminished the level of hope industry in our practice. I'm sure yours, yep. Sam's, and Jeff's. Yeah. So with that, let me, uh, I'll bring on my buddy and pal, Jeff Horowitz. Welcome. I know you were doing another webinar. I said, I'm not doing intros. I'm just introducing my three friends, colleagues, and wonderful teachers. Take it away, pal. Oh, thank you so much, Lou. And um, honestly, what a, what a pleasure to be with, uh, with these three fine gentlemen. Uh, what a pleasure it is to be here with you. And, and I'm gonna give you a little bit different perspective on, on 3D imaging. So um, I don't wanna talk too much about myself other than um, you know, most of my focus in clinical dentistry now is airway and TMJ. And it's been an evolution just through uh, my orthodontic background, having treated a lot of kids. And uh, anyone who knows me knows that this is really where my passion is. Um, we've opened up a couple of satellites in our area where I do nothing really but TMJ, sleep, and orthodontics. So I kind of want to come at this uh, from, a, from a slightly different perspective. You heard two absolutely amazing presentations. Um, Sam laid out the, the basics of CBCT and why it's so important to everyone. Um, and, and Chris just did a beautiful job of showing how that applies into the real world with a real patient experience. So, um, you know, tough acts to follow up, but hopefully I can kind of show you um, how this brings some value to me from a slightly different perspective. So. Um, before I do that, that's my email address uh, that you see at the bottom there, jhorowitzdmd at gmail.com. Please feel free to reach out to me. Um, so one of the things that I like to talk to dentists about is um, how, how we can differentiate ourselves from the rest of the, you know, the big box stores that are out there and how do we make ourselves um, you know, more applicable and, and how do we build value in what we're doing as small group and, and even um, private practitioners. Um, I'm gonna throw the nasty word out there, COVID. Um, I'm sorry to keep doing that. I know that we're just about out of this thing, but um, it still needs to be mentioned the practice overheads have increased uh, with everything that's happened. Infection control mandates, uh, cost and availability of PPE uh, equipment and and other things have absolutely driven the overhead up for most general practices. Um, practice revenues um, certainly have decreased being able to see fewer patients, although I think most of us are being bombarded now as things are, are opening up, but I think that we're going to see some, some OSHA mandates. I think we're gonna see some infection control mandates uh, from the different state boards that are really gonna increase our turnaround time and turnover time between patients. Um, and not that it's a bad thing, I'm not gonna argue that either way, but 
you know, with the increases in overhead and the time that it takes to prepare rooms and get ready, um, you know, I think dentists have been kind of forced to, to look at other sources of revenue and, and how they can be more efficient in practice. And on top of that, that we're seeing a lot of practices decline in value because after COVID, there are a lot of people who said, you know what, this, this just kind of did it for me, I'm done. And so more practices are on the market as well. And I don't want to paint a doom and gloom picture. I, I just want to set the stage for why we should be thinking a little bit differently about clinical practice these days. So, uh, you know, how does a dentist get around some of these changes that we've seen? One, you could charge a PPE fee and COVID-19 infection control fee. Well, uh, I think we've all seen the, the backlash with that. And, you know, I'm with Chris, and, and the last thing I want to do is nickel and dime my patients. And Sam mentioned something about that as well. You know, we don't want to be nickel and diming our patients. We don't want them to see us as just, you know, how do they get another dollar for this procedure or two dollars for this procedure? So that's kind of out the window. In this economic environment, I don't think raising procedure fees is, is a great idea either. Um, and, and certainly we can think about lowering our overhead by increasing efficiencies. And that's always a good idea. We should always be looking at our systems and how we can be more efficient and, and better diagnosticians and, and reduce risk, uh, which I love that, that Chris talked about in, in his presentation. Um, but I think this is really the biggie for modern practice, and that is adding new procedures and providing more comprehensive care. I think Chris laid that out beautifully in, in the case that, that he showed you there, because really it, it's, not about, it's not about how do I just add more procedures, it's how do I provide better diagnosis that exposes the conditions that have been there the whole time that were never seen before? And then how do I manage the expectations, as Chris mentioned, appropriately? And there is no other way to do that unless we think differently and or unless we're willing to get the data that's required to make those decisions and to accomplish that kind of diagnosis. So in thinking differently like this, this is um, how my practice functions now um, is we've actually added, even on days where I'm doing general dentistry, I don't do general dentistry in all the practices, but um, certainly in my main practice, I'm doing some general dentistry. And I typically, like most dentists out there, keep a solid column of, of general dentistry or crowns or placing implants and then I'll have a second overflow column for smaller procedures or things that aren't going to take a lot of my time. Um, but we now run a third efficient column with a sleep uh, care coordinator that oversees that column. And basically, that is just a matter of me popping my head in there every now and then. And it's created a source of revenue in a third column where typically I can generate on a, on a typical day anywhere from 2,000 to 10,000 in a column and, and you know, with a total of maybe 40 minutes of my time throughout the day. So it's just a way that we can think differently. But in order to be able to do something like that, we have to be willing to change the way that we think. We have to be willing to make the investment in the technologies that, that allow us to find the conditions that are already there in so many of our patients. So Chris mentioned this, uh, minimizing risk. I think we have to think about increasing positive outcomes for our patients by performing procedures proven to be most successful. We need to increase positive outcomes for the dentist by reducing the negative outcomes to the patient. And then finally, we have to allow the patients to own their own risks based on a comprehensive diagnosis of their disease and informed consent. Well, you know, this, this is gonna take a little bit of extra effort. This is not something we have traditionally been trained to do in dentistry. And the only way that we can accomplish that is by capturing data. Well, where does that data come from? The data comes from a lot of different places. Yeah, it comes from our examinations, of course, you know, but 
we have to think differently even about our examination. So yeah, this is a patient that bruxes. It's a patient with some abfractive lesions or um, lesions of multiple etiology, if you will, whatever you want to call them. And you know, do we think by traditional methods of just making them a hard plane, uh, flat plane, excuse me, flat plane splint, or do we think, gee, I wonder if there might be an airway problem contributing to this patient's bruxism, um, get the diagnostics, and uh, not only will we improve the outcome if there is an airway problem, but we can prevent a tragic event because if we make this flat plane splint and that patient does happen to be bruxing because they have an airway issue, there's better than a 50% chance that we'll make that patient worse, make their AHI worse and actually decrease the likelihood of a positive outcome, both dentally and medically for that patient. So where does this data come from? The first place I'm gonna tell you it comes from is cone beam imaging. Uh, and, and I'm sure that everyone on this lecture um, you know, all four of us that are here, if you ask any one of us, what is the one thing that you could not practice clinical dentistry without anymore? I bet the first thing out of every mouth is going to be cone beam technology. Why? It is not only value add, it's diagnosis, it's efficiency, it's increased treatment. It's all of those things, but most importantly, it's the data that we need. So I've been using cone beam technology for uh, probably close to 14 years now. I bought my first iCat in uh, my main office. And, you know, I always chuckle when people talk about this being an expensive technology. My first iCat was $197,000, $198,000. I had to build a $20,000 fortress room uh, in order to accommodate the uh, CBCT in South Carolina because the laws were so strict uh, about what you had to do with, with this technology. They just weren't that familiar with it and the safety of it. So, you know, I had over $200,000 in it, and I will tell you, I never looked back from that day. Just charging out as Panorexes, like Sam talked about, um, that more than paid for it. But when I started doing the implant cases and the TMJ cases and the airway cases, I'm like, okay, this was the biggest no-brainer in dentistry at over $200,000. So, you know, I always chuckle when people talk about the investment these days. Well, that technology became old. It was higher radiation. The images weren't that great. I found uh, Prexion. And, and quite honestly, uh, I was impressed by the images that they were able to get. I know Sam talked a lot about their technology and why their images are so good. Uh, the fact that they compile a small focal spot area with a small voxel size, um, just based on that technology, they're able to get a beautiful image. The cost is very reasonable, but last thing is, is I found this to be an incredible customer service company and so when I find those things where I'm getting the kind of support that, that I deserve after making an investment in technology, then that's the company I'm gonna go with. And so we moved on from this, which was my Excelsior. That was the first one we put in. Uh, I replaced my iCat with the Explorer, which is gonna be the larger field of view model. And then because I do so much orthodontics and TMJ, um, we have now moved to the newest addition to the Prexion uh, lineup, which is the Explorer Pro. And uh, so now we're actually able to, even though I was able to generate cephalometric x-rays before from my large field of view scan, now I have the ability with a single pass uh, scan to get a large field of view to get a true cephalometric x-ray if that were indicated Let's say if I had already taken a smaller field of view scan and now I only wanted a CEPH, I think we're only exposing them to eight microsieverts with the cephalometric x-ray uh, and the images are just gorgeous. But uh, this is actually the newest edition. Um, I'm very proud to be the first uh, installed uh, Prexion Explorer Pro in the United States and, and I believe most countries. Um, but when I understood this technology that was coming out, when I opened my third clinic, 
I said, I've got to have this. And uh, so this is a really sexy machine. You can see the CEP arm kind of extending there to, to accommodate the patient. And, and patients are just so impressed by this. And that's not the reason to buy technology. The reason to, to invest in technology is for better data, better diagnosis, and the ROI is going to come from that, especially when you show them the value add service. So uh, this is the plaque that we have installed outside of the unit there. But, um, you know, I, I'm actually one of the few people or, or probably one of the only people that has all three of those models in the lineup in, in different offices. So I'm happy to answer any questions about that that you will. But taking this lecture back to, to where it was really intended was about data. So for me, in my practice, I am a full field of view uh, kind of guy. And for me to be able to take a patient back on the way back, if they have not had a scan in the recent past, my assistant is gonna bring them right to the room, talk about our um, CBCT technology, why we use it, how it's improved our diagnosis. They're gonna get the scan, they're gonna bring the patient into the room. And what, how much time has that taken? You know, less than less than five minutes, certainly, much less than the time that it takes to get a full mouth series. And uh, with that, uh, on my way back to see the patient, while the assistant is going through their discussion with the patient, reviewing the medical history, reviewing some of the uh, intake information with the patient, I'm going to take about five or six minutes to review the scan before I go in and see the patient, ultimately with an incredible amount of data. And uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the efficiencies that we've created and the workflow that we go through in order to be able to do this. But uh, one of the greatest things that this technology has afforded us is the ability to catch these airway and TMJ problems when the patient comes in for diagnosis. And as Chris mentioned to you, I, I mean, it cannot be understated how important this is in the risk management and in the expectation management, because I don't care how good of a clinician you are, you cannot manage an occlusion if you have an unstable jaw joint. And if there are constant degenerative changes going on in the joint space, the occlusion will never be stable. And so you can throw all of that great education that you have in occlusion and all of that great implant education out the window. You cannot reasonably manage the expectations if you don't understand that there might be an underlying problem there. The other part is that we can't always rely on what patients tell us. I know this is gonna be a big shock to all of you, but some of our patients actually lie sometimes. Um, and the name of the patient is up on this scan. Don't worry, the HIPAA police are not coming for me. This is my partner who actually allowed this and gave me full permission to put this up. So this is my associate who told me that he didn't snore and doesn't have any kind of problem with sleep. And um, you know, we make it a point that when we have new technologies that we're all exposed to it and we all understand the technology, what we're seeing from the technology and what it can tell us. So we did a scan on, on good old Marty. And I said, Marty, you're barely breathing standing up in the machine. I said, there's no way this airway is not collapsing. We tested him and certainly we found out that he had um, moderate to, uh, to severe sleep apnea. And just by virtue of doing that um, in, in treating him, we can uh, add 12 to 15 years of life expectancy to him just because we caught that. You wanna talk about a value add? You wanna talk about managing expectations? It's unbelievable. So, you know, I don't wanna discount teeth. Uh, obviously I love teeth, I'm a dentist, I'm all about teeth. Um, but I have to say that breathing has to trump teeth. Um, you know, it doesn't matter how pretty we make the teeth if, you know, the patient is medically compromised because of the apnea, has a heart attack or stroke as they are likely to do, then uh, what good are the beautiful teeth or the great occlusion or, you know, the gorgeous implants that we dropped in? So we have to really stop thinking so much like dentists. And 
Um, you know, the, the problem in, in my mission in life is that right now we're only diagnosing about 10 to 15 percent of all the patients suspected to have OSA there. So, you know, we believe there's about 40 to 50 million Americans out there with undiagnosed OSA. And yet everyone's always talking about, oh, I'm just going to fix the ones who can't use the CPAP. Well, you know, that's, you know, what, maybe, you know, 60, 70 percent of the 10 percent of the patients that were actually diagnosed. No, I'm worried about the 90 percent that have never been diagnosed that are going to drop dead of a heart attack tomorrow. So um, that, that's really kind of my mission in life. And just, you know, by doing this, I can't tell you the number of patients we have screened based on our intake uh, data, not a patient that came to me complaining of problems or knowing that I treated patients with OSA, but patients just coming to Jeff Horowitz, the dentist, and Jeff Horowitz said, oh my gosh, we need to get this checked out. And them going, oh my God, where has this been all my life? Why has my doctor not told me this? Why had, did my last dentist not tell me this? You want to talk about value add? Um, it, this is how you differentiate yourself. I can't say it any other way. So, um, you know, that, that's my passion. We know the risks that are involved with untreated OSA. I'm not going to get into that. But, the, you know, really what we need to understand is as a risk factor for cardiovascular disease, for stroke, there is no other condition that remotely approaches the risk of having undiagnosed or untreated OSA. So, you know, for me, the biggest part of screening has been 3D imaging. It, it is just right there. It's available to us. Um, you know, this is actually uh, something that I helped Prexion with when we were working um, to get approval for their airway imaging uh, component for their module, which um, Sam showed you a little bit of that. And it is such a gorgeous show and tell for the patients. I, I, I mean, I can't tell you how valuable that's been to me for show and tell and for having patients accept the fact that they truly do have a problem. But, you know, this is just from the same basic scan. This is not a quote unquote airway scan. This is my basic intake scan that I do on every single patient. So, you know, you can see the small pharyngeal airway just looking at the general picture from the axial view that you see here. Um, we can measure cross-sectional area of the airway. Um, and that's a really important number to understand, the minimum cross-sectional area at the smallest point. Um, but I'll tell you, it, if you're only taking images for what you're doing, you know, and you say, oh, this patient's coming to me. And uh, by the way, you know, I know Sam showed you a lot of this stuff, but patients come to me and they're like, oh, I want a couple of implants. Am I only going to take an image of that section of the arch? Mm, probably not. I mean... Yeah, I'll do that if they've had a full uh, field of view scan in, in the recent past. But if they haven't had a full field of view recent scan, no, I'm doing the full field of view scan because yeah, I wanna know if I can place the implants. I'm gonna use their implant module and you know be able to show the patient, oh yeah, I can drop one in here. I can drop one in here. I can drop one in here. You know, We can have the computer plan it and uh, you know, I can send this off, have a surgical guide made, you know, lots of cool stuff we can do. But, oh my gosh, you might be a surgical risk. You might have a problem with anesthesia or sedation because when I ran the airway module, it's showing me that there's a really constricted area in your airway while you're awake and alert. This creates a risk for apnea if you're sedated during the implant surgery. So don't we want to find out about that? Don't we want to know about that before the patient comes in for sedation paperwork? Um, you know, and, and you don't even have to be <laughs> providing the sedation. You know, even if someone else is doing the surgery and you're not doing sedation, you know, isn't this great information for the patient to have? Of course it is. So this is the airway module being run on that patient and the black areas are areas where uh, we're looking at a very constricted area, an area that, that are at high risk by minimum cross-sectional area of uh, being at high risk for having OSA. So, you know, you can look subjectively and that's typically what I'm doing for myself in the five minute 
overview when I'm looking at the scans. Um, but you know, if I want to go into more detail, if I want to print something out for the patient that shows them clearly what's going on, then I'm going to run the airway module, print out some pictures, not just put them on the screen, print out a picture because I want them to take that home and I want them to look at that um, over and over again. And, and that will help them make the decision, hopefully, to treat the life-threatening illness as well as the dental uh, condition that we're there to treat. So, um, you know, we can look at the axial view, as I said, subjectively, this is a small area. You can see it collapsing on one side more so than the other. You can run the airway module um, and we can look at the, uh, the uh, smallest area constriction. Again, you know, you can do volumetric measurements. You can do minimum cross-sectional area. What we know is that in adults, that's where the rubber meets the road is in the minimum cross-sectional area of the airway at the smallest point, which is typically gonna be at that junction of C1 and, and C2. By the way, we can also get a good look at the cervical spine, not that any of you are gonna be experts in that, um, but uh, we actually have a cervical spine specialist that refers patients to me for scans of the cervical spine and he interprets them. And you know they're, they're just for his use and basically I'm just the facility that takes it. And uh, typically they all come and, and just pay cash for the scan. So, um, you know, it's uh, yeah, ROI, as I said, I, I chuckle about that when, when people ask me about ROI on, on comb beam technology. Um, but anyway, we can look at this also in the coronal view and, and see where the area of constriction is. So, you know, we're noting, is this a tonsillar issue? Is this an adenoidal issue? Is it a base of the tongue issue? Is it a soft palate issue? Um, and we can superimpose these images. So again, um, this actual case study was used uh, to get clearance uh, for the airway module in, in a few countries with Prexion. And it was something I was really happy to participate in because um, you know I think stuff like this just advances our profession uh, incredibly. And you know, for me, I save one life by doing this. Um, mission accomplished as far as I'm concerned. So, um, you know, you can do things like go back, you can reposition the patient. And this is actually the patient uh, with a repositioning appliance in place. And you can see the vast changes to the airway. That big area of black is now one tiny little area of black. And the smallest area is uh, almost a centimeter larger than it was before. So, um, you know, we can show the patient that there's been improvement. This is typically not the way that I'm going to do my follow-up. Uh, this was done more so to acknowledge the validity of the airway analysis tool. Um, you know, we're going to do a follow-up sleep study to make sure that what we're seeing here subjectively is the truth uh, objective, objectively. So um, anyway, that's really a cool note about the airway module. Um, you know, it's funny, I, I always see when I go to the meetings, all these companies, you know, showing different views and, and all these pretty pictures. And I'm just telling you, it's not about how pretty, you know, the, the reconstruction of the airway is. It's how easy it is to get the data that you need. Volume means nothing to me in the oropharyngeal airway of an adult. What means a lot to me is the minimum cross-sectional area. So if I have a quick show and tell, this means nothing to a patient. What does mean a lot to them is, you know, just a, a good color graphic that shows them the area of constriction and, uh, and allows them to see, hey, we got a problem here. So um, it's all about minimum cross-sectional area. Um, if, uh, you know, you ever hear a, a course that, that I'm involved with, we'll get into a lot of detail about that. But we can also uh, learn a lot about nasal resistance and use cone beam imaging as a resource to develop a referral um, network. So very often we'll find problems in the nasal cavity with the turbinates, with the nasal valve, um, with the adenoidal tissue, with the tonsils. Um, we'll be able to identify nasal resistance for a lot of patients and make a referral to the ENT again that's not my area of expertise, but it's going to be an area that I'm going to be able to take note of and make a referral to the experts of the nasal cavity, which are going to be the ENTs. And guess who those ENTs refer to 
when the patient needs dentistry or needs oral appliance therapy, they're going to refer back to me. So it's a great opportunity for creating a, a, a network, uh, a referral network. Um, I'm not going to get into these studies uh, other than to say that really one of the, the critical things to understand is that uh, for the adult, the oropharyngeal airway minimum cross-sectional area is really the number that you want to be able to get to quickly and understand. Um, and for children, we also have to be aware that understanding the nasopharyngeal volume is critical in knowing whether a child is going to have a problem or not. So uh, we've got lots of studies that, that talk about relating the three-dimensional airway measurements uh, in, in pediatric sleep apnea patients. And as I said, uh, the conclusion here is a little different than in the adults. And again, we take full field of view on kids, even though it may not be, uh, it may not be a 15 by 16 full field of view. I may go down in size. I'm going to base it on the size of the child but I'm gonna get that, I'm gonna look at the tonsils, I'm gonna look at the airway, I'm gonna look at the TMJs because kids have all these problems and very often we can catch them when they present as children and help to avoid problems later on. So the conclusion to this study was that contrary to the finding in adults, nasopharyngeal volume is what really shows promise when screening for sleep apnea in kids when CBCT scans are available. And guess what? CBCT scans are available all the time in my office. So remember that this does start in children. This is about kids. And we have the ability based on clinical symptoms, uh, based on clinical presentation, dry lips, crowded arches, uh, allergic eyes, shiners under the eyes, you know, dry mouth, poor tongue posturing, the list goes on and on. Um, you know, we also have the ability to talk to mom. How are they sleeping? Do they sleep through the night? How is their school performance? How are things going in school? How is the behavior? These are all questions we can be answering. And again, um, I think creating a value added service uh, for a lot of what we do in typical everyday dentistry. So, um, you know, these are just some of the things you want to look for on these kids, uh, mouth breathing, tongue posture, tonsils, adenoids, dental crowding, high palatal vault, nasally voice, vacant look to the eyes, um, snoring, God forbid witnessed apneas, poor performance in school, uh, ADHD signs, and we have the ability to do a lot for these patients. So CBCT lets me see their adenoids, uh, which is amazing because uh, as dentists, we typically don't have the opportunity. Well, we can look at the tonsils, and how many of these kids do we see at recall after recall after recall that uh, either the pediatrician or, um, you know, that, that, or, or the primary care physician says, you know, hey, we don't need to do anything. They're not touching in the back of the throat. They'll outgrow this. Well, yeah, they may outgrow it, but at what expense? Poor tongue posturing, poor growth and development, poor school behavior. ADHD, um, poor, you know, uh, dental arch development, poor orthodontic presentation for phase two. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And finally, sleep apnea as an adult. So uh, aside from looking at the tonsils and the oral cavity, um, we have the ability to also look at the lingual tonsils, which are a little bit more difficult to see the sublingual tonsils. Um, in the mouth without pressing the tongue down and getting a bunch of breakfast on you. Um, and the only other way to see the adenoids is by scoping them or sticking the mirror up behind the uvula. And uh, I, I don't know many of my colleagues that really want to do that on a bunch of kids every day. So um, CDCT allows that opportunity. So, hey, you can look at some of the, even some of the tonsillar tissue that would not be evident in the mouth um, through an oral examination. And then certainly here you can see the adenoidal tissue. So we have the ability then to do things like arch development, whether you know, and you don't have to do braces in your office like I do, you don't have to not to do straight wire. I mean, that's one of the opportunities that's available, but you know, we can do arch expansion. We can refer to our orthodontic friends if we're really not comfortable uh, performing orthodontic um, movements or are doing any ortho at all we have the ability to send them over to our friendly orthodontist who are very comfortable with 
with these types of procedures. And, you know, it's just come so far. So in kids, we're doing this quite often. If, if they're kind of on the borderline of whether or not to get the tonsils and adenoids out, and I have the ability to increase breathing uh, by expanding the arches, increasing the size of the nasopharyngeal volume. And by the way, that's what you're doing when you are uh, expanding, you're increasing the nasopharyngeal volume, which I showed you in that study was one of the most important things we can do for a child. So very often we can get them out of the tonsil and adenoid surgery by doing some arch expansion. And if you're worried about the time that it takes, we can, if they're class two, even do some mandibular advancement, um, which will open the airway for them immediately while you're going through the arch expansion at the same time. So we're doing this a lot now with a product called Invisalign First. Um, and Invisalign First not only incorporates the arch expansion, the growth and development, uh, but it also helps with repositioning of the mandible in these kids. So we're improving the airway at the same time immediately and um, improving the ability to correct their class two um, at an earlier point in treatment. So um, just a, a lot of great stuff out there about airway. I'm starting to get close on time here. Um, and I want to talk some about the TMJ as well. But, you know, just, just remember, don't, you know, don't get so caught up in your dental world that we forget about our patients' overall wellness in the end. And uh, breathing really does uh, trump the teeth. And, uh, you know, you, you can always fix teeth. You can even replace teeth, but uh, it's pretty hard to replace people. So, you know, as I said, someone comes in for an implant, don't be so, uh, you know, don't be so narrow viewed that you feel like you only have to look at that one particular area. Um, really, we should be looking at the foundation. We should be looking at the airway at the same time because there are other risks. You know, if I looked at just the area for the implant on this patient, I said, oh yeah, that's a slam dunk. You know, I run my Prexion implant module here and Yep, uh, I can get it in perfectly. Here's where it's going to go. I can, you know, create the uh, the tooth form. I can do a digital scan and do a digital wax up, you know, and and start from the restoration down, making sure that this is in the right place, and uh, all is well and good. And oh, this has a very favorable prognosis based on the bone density. Blah 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 blah. Or does it? You know why we don't know if it does because we didn't look at the joint. So what happens when you get a patient like this and now you go and look at the joint and you see a foundation like this? Look at this left temporomandibular joint. So we take our crosshairs, um, we can, um, I went ahead long, I'm sorry. We take the crosshairs, we correct for the angulation of the condyle in the axial view. We correct for the angulation as well in the coronal view. And I wanna look for a few things. Is the articular space concentric here and here? No, it's not. Is the, is the, um, is the condyle centered in the fossa? Well, look at, this, uh, look at this coronal view. No, it's not. I also wanna look at the quality of the bone. As I go back at that picture, is that a normal shaped condyle subjectively? Absolutely not. Look at the osteophytic beaking there. So I need to know if this joint is stable or not, because if that joint is breaking down, if we are having continuous changes that, are, that the patient is undergoing, um, if we are seeing continuous arthritic change in that joint space, that will ultimately affect the occlusion. It will change the bite. It could put undue stress on the occlusion of our implant or other areas of the arch, and that will compromise our long-term outcome. So we can look over at the right joint and see that that joint, this is a little bit more ideal of what we see. Is it centered in the fossa? Is the articular space concentric all the way around? And this one looks much, much better. So you can see what we're doing. There's some key measurements that we can look at. You know, does the condyle take up about 60% of the fossa space? You know, is there about 160 square millimeters? We can use our Prexion measurement tool and look at those things. This is not a full-fledged TMJ course, but it's a course to just make you aware of the possibilities 
and the abilities to, to really measure outcomes and predict outcomes and, and to understand the risks. So, you know, and again, on this same patient, oh yeah, by the way, you're a sedation risk. Look at the oropharyngeal airway on this same exact patient. So, you know, how do you do that? You know, you start by investing in the technology that lets you create comprehensive diagnosis. You don't have to be an airway expert, just learn at what constitutes a risk in the airway. You can add a source of practice revenue that requires minimal doctor time and effort. You can provide more comprehensive dentistry and you can decrease your overhead by providing the care efficiently. Less chair time means more profitability. At the same time, we're gonna decrease patient risk medically and dentally, and we're providing a true quality of life service that, that's gonna save lives inevitably. <laughs> Pardon me. And so we've gotta have access to airway imaging. We've gotta have access to basic TMJ imaging. We've gotta not, we don't have to be experts in this area. We just have to know when something doesn't look right. Contrary to what most people think, we are not responsible for everything that shows up on any image that we have. If you catch a little bit of the cervical spine on a panoramic x-ray, do you really think as a practitioner that you're responsible to understand every problem of the cervical spine like an orthopedist would? No, you are not. You're only expected to diagnose and see what the average dentist with your training would be expected to see. So this thing about if it's on the scan, you're responsible for it. What a bunch of garbage. I, I've served as an expert witness in many, many cases, and I've spoken to a lot of, of litigation attorneys about this. And it's really about what someone else with your training would be expected to see or to understand in a given situation. So you know, don't think just because something shows up on an x-ray somewhere and it's, it's out of the realm of what you typically do that you're responsible for all that. I think that's the biggest bunch of hooey I've ever heard about not getting this kind of diagnostic capability. So all these are areas that, that you can um, look at imaging with. Um, I have a little acronym that I like to go by because people are like, how do you look at a scan in, in five or six minutes? And for me, I, I just have a system that I go through. I have a video of how I do this. Um, unfortunately, you know, time is, is going to prevent me from going through the whole video. Um, but I want to give you this, this methodic way that I go through all of my scans with a new patient. So I told you, they're getting them back. <clears throat> I'm going to review the scan while my assistant is talking to them. It's going to take me about five minutes. And uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go through the the pants method, and uh, this is something a little acronym that I developed. It just makes it, it's easy for me to remember, and anyone who knows me knows I need things that are easy to remember. So um, I go through my my little pants evaluation, and that is um, I will look at the panoramic overview, which by the way we get a gorgeous panoramic image that is developed from that same scan. I'm going to look at that as my overview to look for missing teeth, third molars. Um, I'm going to look for any obvious pathology. I'm going to look for asymmetries. I'm going to look for uh, prior surgeries, fractures, things like that. It opens the conversation there. Then I'm going to look at the oropharyngeal airway. If there's a concern, I may run the airway pool by Prexion, but I'm going to Instead, you know, just look at it subjectively. Is this a patient that might have a problem? This is not the be all end all of airway, but it will tell me and screen a lot of patients that are at high risk that may otherwise not give me any other indications that there's an airway problem. And I'm gonna look at the nasal airway. Are there any breathing problems contributing to orthodontic problems or that could contribute to a potential airway problem? Do I need to be working with an ENT? Then I'm going to look at the TM joints and understand my foundation. And then finally, I'm going to go through my segmented arches to look at the teeth, look if there's room for the implants. I'm not going to run my implant tool unless I know I'm placing implants. What I am going to do is just make some really basic measurements. Uh, and, and when I do that, know if it's even possible to get an implant in there. So you can get very methodical. You can get really efficient with this kind of technology. 
you know, that's my old iCat. That was my old two hundred thousand dollar machine over there. Um, and I was I was called that my that was my second home, uh, my first second home. <laughs> but um, you know, what would you rather get in? The, the 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 technology now has made it where it's easy for patients who are sitting or standing to get into a machine that's reasonably priced, that's very comfortable that can run a scan in seven or eight seconds, a standard exposure scan, and get some of the most gorgeous images in the industry. So um, with that, I'll leave it there. Um, I'll tell you, I always leave every lecture I do with this statement that your beliefs don't make you a better person, your behavior does. Um, I wanna thank Prexion for all their fantastic customer support. They're just an amazing partner to work with. And, uh, and certainly to my buds at, at Catapult Education and, and Lou and Sam and Chris. And what an honor to just be on here with all of you. So, so before I bring the, the, our, our other two, Saman, let me just ask you some, ba that was a great course, Jeff. Just, it's amazing. You. It's just amazing what we can do in 40 minutes. <laughs> I, I really believe it. So yeah. I, I think this is really interesting because when you talk about your pants, and I'll, I'll keep it clean, <laughs> but when you talk about your pants, your basic CBCT on every new patient walking into your office is your large field of view scan, correct or incorrect? 100%, but I, I wanna be clear about yeah, something. Please. Please. Large field of view does not mean I run a 15 by 16 on everybody. Okay. okay? Even if, I, you know, if the adult is large enough that that's what I need to see the joints and the airway, then that's what I'm going to run. But even at the 15 by 16 in a, in a standard scan, you know, the amount of radiation that we're talking about is absolutely comparable or less to a full mouth series. And I'm not going to need to do a lot of adjunctive scans or if they need ortho, do another Seth, or if they have third molars that need to come out, do another pano or, or take another view. So I have no problem with doing that, but for a lot of patients who are smaller, you know, smaller females or, or even kids, I'm gonna go to a smaller field of view. I just need to get what I need to see. So, you know. Right. Whatever so, we have to do. Right, I would say, so let's just say you a smaller person's in your chair and you're not going to go to the large field of view, the largest, what would be your next size that you routinely go to for everybody listening? So, uh, you know, there's a, there's a great 15 by eight that, that we can get amazing yeah. images from, yeah. um, you know, it, 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 it is so patient centric. And yeah. what I like about the unit is that we have the ability to you know, take that initial quick image that shows what we're going to see. To see it, it will show all the structures that we are going to see right. when we capture our full CBCT. It's, we call it our scout image. And so we know based on that, if we capture that scout image yep. and I can go to a smaller field of view, I'll do it. You know, it's right. as low as reasonably allowable. Yeah, so I, I hear you 100%. So let's... Let's talk about the majority of offices still today that don't do sleep. I mean, it is the way it is and you know it. Okay, so I think if you have a cone beam, you still owe it to yourself to be evaluating these patients with what you just showed. And if at the very least develop a referral pattern out and because it, you're still helping each and every one of these patients both for sleep and TMJ or both, your thoughts? I, I couldn't agree with what you're saying more, Lou. It's, you know, it, it, so let's say, so I have a, a satellite practice in, in an area where I don't do any general dentistry. We don't have a hygienist there. And I did that solely for the purpose of, I wanted dentists that did not want to be involved in airway management to have someone that they could send to and not worry about, oh my God, they're gonna steal the patient or you know, they're gonna like that office better or something. You know, that it, let, let's face it, that's a reality. So you know, when, if you say you don't wanna do airway management, I still believe we have an obligation 
to find the really high risk patients and get them to somebody who does. So these dentists that are referring to me for sleep when they find these patients, you know, just from a routine scan, who am I going to send back to when they need dentistry? Or when I find a TMJ case and I'm like, here's the restorative we're going to need. I need to work with your restorative dentist. I'll be in touch with, you know, or if they don't have one, you know, I'm not in that area. And it's just, it's a no brainer. Yeah. I, I, I really, it's amazing. I just want everybody on this to understand. We're not saying you have to be placing implants. We're not saying you have to be doing endo and doing sleep. All we're doing is really creating the awareness that you're going to give your patient the best diagnostics opportunity. Correct, Jeff? Couldn't say it better. Okay. So now I'm going to dive a little deeper. So last week, I'm having the privilege of having late afternoon cocktails with Michael Gelb and Lane Martin talking about expanding the palate, airway, CBCTs. This is where they're going and you know them both well. I think it's important to talk about this because a lot of us obviously are treating adults. I'm assuming today you're expanding palates as part of your treatment. Is that an incorrect? Uh, no, not I. That for kids, we're doing it all the time. I, we do so much of it. You know, the best time to expand a child is as soon as you spot a crossbite, as soon as you notice any kind of an issue with nasal breathing, as soon as you've referred them out when you've noticed that their tonsils are enlarged and then the ENT says, well, I'm not ready to take the tonsils out. We, there's just so much that we can do from a growth and development and, and orthopedic standpoint that will improve the quality of life for the for the child and and hopefully give them a better life as an adult you know not as an aptic hopefully right so let's just say i'm sitting in your chair i'm and you look at me and you go lou you're apneic and you have a narrow arch is part of your treatment today on your patients literally correcting their arches as part of their sleep. That's what I'm asking you, yeah. Jeff Horowitz. Yeah, 100%. So here's the thing about doing that though, is that that's not an instant fix. And it's not a guaranteed fix in and right. of itself. Right. We know that, it, and, and we can routinely expand arches on adults now. It is, even without surgical enhancement, we're doing micro osteoperforation, uh, and getting incredible expansion of the adult arches and uh, with like Propel, I'm sure you're familiar with that. Yep. Um, you know, you don't even have to go with the, with the full cortical scoring and um, th there's just a lot of ways to get that expansion. And we absolutely 100% know that we can improve the size of the nasopharyngeal airway when we do that, we know we can improve parts of the oropharyngeal airway. Right. But we give more room for the tongue as well. So it's always for every patient part of the discussion. How many patients are going to typically go forward with it? It's. I'd love to tell you it's a bigger percentage of what I do. It's not. It's right, right, right. The real world is most are not going to do it, but it is 100% offered to every single patient. Typically, we will start with either CPAP therapy or an oral appliance until they're ready to commit because, you know, that takes time. Right, right. So, Jeff, one last comment or, or question. So one of the best things about hosting these things, I get to learn from three speakers. It's the best thing. I, just, I agree. I always yeah. learn, too. Yeah. So the joint. You know, when I started out, you were smarter than me. You, you went into TMJ, you went into that. Diet. no, 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 there's no doubt that you went into TMJ and really started understanding the joint when only a minority of the profession really were getting into this. So as we learn more and more and have cone beams now as an option, case in point, I have a woman who's 55 who walks into my practice. I take a 15 by eight this week. She opens 30 millimeters. And the first thing I'm looking at are her joints. And who did I learn this from? Sadly, you. Okay, <laughs> go. It's, I don't get to hear that that often. So great, I'll take it. <laughs> I'll deny it. Okay, so 
here's the question to the audience. So you're looking and you've got flat condyles, the beaking going on. How do you know these people are stable? How, how would you guide the viewers when they start taking these 15 by eights and 16s? They have no pain, but they're flat and they have limited opening. Um, so that is actually a two day course by itself. Like there's no way I, I could do that in one minute. Forget about um, uh, in a few seconds. What yep. I will say is you have to use all the data. So the scan will tell you that there, the alerts you that there's a problem. You do not know from the scan if it's stable or unstable okay. unless you have a prior scan to really compare it to or unless you get into like um, MRI imaging to actually look at the disc. Right. I'll tell you the best way though, is the functional information. And I'm sure Chris will agree with this um, because he uses T-scan and, and he's really aware of all the minute changes that can happen in the occlusion when the foundation is off. Right. So right. Um, by asking patients if they've had changes to their bite, that's going to typically be a sign that you have an unstable joint if there's been a lot of change in the occlusion and it's not been associated with any recent dentistry. That's about the fastest answer that I could give. That's a great answer. Yeah. That's really a great answer. So if I love this, so I'm going to uh, bring uh, Chris and Sam back into this. Let me see your faces and unmute. Great guys. Um, hey guys. So, hey Jeff. Good afternoon. Wait, where's the where's the drinks you were sharing with the other crew? We don't we don't get them. What's going on here? You're on Eastern time. It's not happy hour here yet. <laughs> oh, it's 10 a.m. somewhere, Chris. <laughs> so, Chris, I'm just curious. I want to follow up, and then I want to talk some some really basic good questions to the group. When you're looking, when when you're doing an initial exam, and then to Sam. What field of view are you taking as a routine field of view? Go ahead, Sam. Uh, for me, it's 10 by eight. If I'm just looking in general and I'm not worried about anything else and I'm kind of looking at the health history, looking at some of the questionnaire of what they've answered and some things. If we start to, um, we do an airway analysis uh, questionnaire on every single patient. So if I'm seeing something in that, that just triggered, hey, hey guys, that's not what the scan we're gonna take. We're gonna take the larger scan. We're gonna take the, 15 by eight or 15 by 13. And actually just to kind of let Jeff know, uh, for those of, I mean, Jeff knows this, but medical imaging also, Jeff, they, they require a 15 by 15 now, don't they, for most of these in order to pay through medical, so. You know, that's actually a great point. I don't handle the billing uh, yeah. anymore because I got a sleep coordinator that took care of all that stuff that I used to worry about. But um, that's a great point, Sam. I'm gonna actually ask about that. Yeah, so if that's something where, I, as soon as I see that in our evaluation, some of the things that they're entering in the health history, that's when I may be changing what type of scan we're gonna, or what type of image we're gonna take and the size of it. Very Chris? interesting. Yeah, um, thanks. Dude. For yeah. a TMJ referral patient, I will take a, a small field of view of the joints. And in Prexion, it is, you take two views, you take the right view and the left view. Um, and I, I think that the contrast is wonderful in those smaller views um, in that dedicated area. But um, traditionally it's 10 by eight view for any dental patient coming in. Um, Sam, I'm no sleep expert either, but we also screen for it um, because there are people like Jeff that just have that ability to help these people. And, and let me say, while I've got everybody and our viewers listening, a 10 by 8 field of view really replaces an FMX. We would all agree. Um, but I would also say, unless it's a large individual, if you can get pretty much, if you can minimize any wasted space in the anterior of the mandible, you can pretty much capture airways and a 10 by 8 for everybody listening. You won't get condyles. But you will capture airway, except on people maybe Chris's size. Um, I, I, Jeff, what do you think about that? I 100% agree with that, that you will get the airway. You will absolutely not in the 10 by 8 get the joints. May, you will Now, again, you may do on a child, you may. And, yep. and that's where I say you, you just got to look at your scout view, too, and, and see what you're going to get. You want to obviously minimize it as much as possible. 
Um, but, um, but yeah, otherwise, if you're going to the 10 by eight and you're, you do want to see the joints, then like Chris said, you would take that individual TMJ view. Um, for me, I'm just getting it in my general yep. view at, yep. at the first appointment. So I, I want to dial us down and dial us back. So if this is a foreign language to the majority of people out there, it won't be once you get into comb beam. And, and I want to be clear here, field of views, axial, sagittal, this all becomes secondary. Ball bearings. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to talk about everybody's biggest fear. How am I going to learn this? How am I going to get trained? So Sam, I'm going to go back to you. So what do you feel about the learning curve? So I will tell you this, and I want to be clear here. I, Prexion was not my first go at comb beam. And yet I felt the company was unbelievably committed to getting me trained in reading comb beams far better than my first go round. I'll just leave it at that. But openly, what would you recommend to doctors? And I'm going to ask each of you this. I'm about to purchase a comb beam. What's the best way to get trained? We're going to get to radiology reading after you answer this. What's the best way to get trained, Sam? Um, I think the best way to do it is the way they start it. They'll bring somebody in and they train your staff on how to take it first. And they spend half a day with you on using it. Now, I, I'm a little obsessive compulsive. So to me, every time I had a lunch, come on, really, you're surprised. Um, every time I had a lunch or I had anything, I was sitting on the computer eating and playing with a software and trying to manipulate it. And I'm also on their site. They have some excellent videos of, to show you things if you're not sure of. Um, I, it, it's great to learn those basics at first. And to me, once we learned that and about three, four weeks later, I had more questions. I had them come back actually and do a little more training to further it along because I had a lot of questions and that really, you, you really, it's like anything else I said, once you start, you start learning step-by-step step, and every time yep. you learn and you see something, you're going to remember it the next time you see it. So you start knowing a lot more and you're able to go through and read these in like five minutes, like the guys are saying, once you've seen hundreds of these, but you, you do learn it step by step and it starts to get better and faster, like with everything else that you learn in dentistry. Jeff? That yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I think, you know, the, the first thing is realizing where, where your strengths and, and, and the things that you need, because we all practice clinically. You heard it on, on this webinar you know we all practice a little bit differently so you know if you're not very comfortable with the joint and you say okay well you know this will work for me for 99 percent of what i'm going to do and if i have to get a joint image then i'm going to take just that single you know double pass uh joint image then then that's great but I think the first part is Prexion is amazing at, at sending trainers into your office. They will ask you what it is you're wanting to get out of the technology, and they will help you develop a flow that allows you to do that. And, and so, you know, again, I, I, I think that it's absolutely critical to understand what it is that you're trying to get out of it. I would just say as a general dentist who is always ex kind of trying to expand my knowledge, I just want to have the thing that I can get the most information from with the fewest actual x-rays. Yeah. So yeah. if I can get that to start with and not have to take additional x-rays down the road, that's great. And so when my trainer from Prexion came in, that's what we talked about. And that's how we kind of developed that, that pants method. But that might not be the flow for some yeah. yeah. Chris? Even though I am obviously the oldest one in the group here, I was probably the last, um, I'm sure the last to sign on to my own CBCT. I had great, avail great availability of a truck. The difficulty, so I had some experience um, the truck had an ICAD in it. So I had some experience in manipulating data, but I found it somewhat difficult. And for those that, that had a truck or have a truck or think that I should get 
access to a mobile CT unit. The problem I had with the mobile CT unit is I was only sending patients out there that I knew needed a CBCT. But the amount of things that I saw once we took it on all patients made me feel like I was um, deficient in what I had been providing all these years. How much did I miss because of how much more I saw once I actually had my own unit? So the first unit I owned was Prexion. Um, and like I said, I had some experience in ICAT data manipulation. Tony that came in here did an absolutely incredible job as a trainer. But I also found that the software was so much more easy to manipulate totally. than other units. Yeah. The ease of getting to where you want to go and how you want to look at it. Um, I, I had to have, I don't do lateral sinus windows. So I refer it to the surgeon. I send over the CBT, CBCT and he says to me, where, what unit do you have? Because these images are so much better than what they have in their surgical suite. So between the images and the ease of data manipulation, it, uh, it just made it wonderful. So Chris, let me ask you this. I totally agree. So I haven't taken an FMX, I think in six years. And if someone's due for an FMX in hygiene, here's a standard question we all get when we're doing this live. I think I used to teach live, I'm starting to forget. Okay, so FMX, hygiene, whether the hygienist takes it or the assistants take it, you're in the middle of doing whatever. When are you rever re reviewing your CBCTs of, of hygiene patients? Chris, and then Sam, quickly. I will review it briefly with them, but I will tell them that I'm going to spend time while they're away and review it more in depth so that if there is a concern, we will touch base with them unless they want a phone call either way. Okay. But it for me, it takes more time than I want to spend in front of the patient because if you do find something, then the conversation gets even longer and other people in the office are waiting for me. So I prefer to do a brief overview with the patient. One thing that does is impresses the patient with the technology, but I wanna do it on my own time so that I can really take a look at it. Now, how long does that take? Five minutes. Okay, Six so minutes. a follow-up, follow-up. Do you always make a chart entry that you reviewed the CBCT? Yes. Very important point. Sam, your thoughts? Yeah, no, absolutely. The same as Chris, uh, about five minutes. If it's a little more involved and it's a hygiene thing, then a lot of times I'm saying, you know, let's do this another time. Or if you want to wait a few minutes, I've got another chair that's going to pull open here and I can come in there and talk to you about this and then kind of detail it out and spend a little more time with them if it's more involved. But always make a note that we do uh, chart it in there as well. Okay, Jeff? Couldn't agree more. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, Jeff, I want to start with you. So, I wanted to close today on, well, no, before I close today on money, how often do you send out to oral radiologists? Because I want everybody to understand there's beam readers, a variety of companies that we can send the data to so that nobody's out there alone in the fear of missing. So how often do you send a scan to a radiologist to have somebody review something you don't understand? Jeff, I'll start with you. For me, maybe it's once a month, but I've looked at, you know, I've had CBCT 14 years, so I've got a routine. I know what to look for that's abnormal. And when I see something abnormal, that's when I'm going to send it off. But I would encourage everyone to have that relationship. And Prexion actually sets that up for them where if there's anything they don't understand or don't feel comfortable with, they have that ability. Great point, Jeff. Chris, how often do you send out? Um, about once a month as well. It used to be more because I was cautious. Um, what if I miss something? But CBCT is no different than uh, plain film radiograph in that regard. You, you, you learn what normal is, and then you look for something that's not normal. And right. so you learn how to visualize abnormal. Sam? 
That's pretty much the same because when I first started, I was doing it a lot more because there were things that I was seeing and I wasn't sure of. And it's like, you're like in that nowhere land, but then you send it and then you start learning as they send it back and you read these reports, it really teaches you. And like, okay, the mm -hmm. next time I see this, I know what this is. That's um, a great the point. The thing that I would say is if anybody's worried about the cost of this as well, is my thought is when you actually do that, you can tell the patient, hey, you know, I need to send this for an actual radiologist to read it. The charge is like, you know, 110 bucks or something like that. Let me tell you, no one's going to say no to that. It's like getting a blood test at your physicians. Who's ever going to say no to that? You know, I need an extra test to kind of clarify something. So don't ever fear not doing that. Oh no, what's the patient going to think? That's, that's a given. I've never had anybody question that. I absolutely, Sam, bill the patient. If they're going to charge me a buck and a quarter, I just tell the patient I need a second pair of eyes. Yep. This is a little bit unusual. I don't want you to worry, but I absolutely am not going to absorb that cost. So costs. Okay. So let's say the average machine today is $75,000 and up if you get whatever and whatever. So let's say it's $1,800 a month, whatever it is, after all the write-offs, whatever those are. As far as the costs go, I know Chris kind of touched on this. Um, I have replaced my FMX by billing insurance companies, bite wings and a Panorex to get the FMX covered because they're not going to, if you take a CBCT and they're not going to cover it, I don't want it to be on my patient. And I'm not going to charge the CP, CBCT, like Sam said, and not want the patient. I don't want to blow them away on the first visit. Chris said the same. How do you handle costs in your practice? Jeff, I'm going to start with you. I'm going to end with Sam on costs. So like Sam, um, these are built out as panoramics for everyone. I'm not, I'm just trying to get as much information as I can and be as comprehensive as I can. So they're never out anything there. I don't routinely take bite wings on everyone. It's only if I feel like I need the bite wings, as you said, if there's a lot of metal and we just have other diagnostic tools that have taken right. the place of that. Um, and, you know, other than that, um, you know, we still have lots of opportunities with medical billing to, to bill out for these scans at a higher rate, but even at the panoramic and what, what you get paid for a panoramic that pays for it by itself. It did when yeah. I had a $200,000 machine. So it pays for it by itself. And then, you know, the rest is gravy. What you, what you do from what you see is gravy. Chris. Thanks, well, you, you, you throw out a number, 1800 a month. Let's just accept that. Panoramic hundred bucks. You don't do 18 new patients a month. You're, that's, um, that's a concern. <laughs> so when, when these patients come in and say, well, I just had x-rays. Okay. Um, that's fine. Absolutely. Then we will still take the CBCT for no charge yep. because I need that information. Um, so we're not going to uh, try to bill the, the insurance company or the patient for that, that scan. The other thing that's interesting about the Prexion, for those that may be concerned that how can you legally justify taking a CBCT and charging a pan? Well, the beauty of the Prexion is they have a remodeled Panorex with the scan. Right. So you have a pan available it's just that you also happen to have a cbct available so right. um there's no legalities in it right it works right sam yeah the only thing i would add to that is i've had patients that come in and they're like oh i brought my x-rays with me and, and you've seen some of the quality of some of these things and people walk in with them and i'm just trying to look at this sometimes they try to email them and they look horrible and other times they bring them in on paper and i just tell them i go i tell my team i go just tell them we're going to take a CT scan on you. We're not going to charge you for it. We just want to know, we'll be really comprehensive, know exactly what you need. And you know, this one's on us, but we want to know what's going on with you. That's huge to a patient. Yeah. You just gave them a $285 item yeah. for free. So, so that starts yeah. a relationship already to me. I, I agree, Sam. So it's interesting because I want to close on this from an anonymous attendee. And I'm not, I, I'm very complimentary of all these questions. So the anonymous attendee writes, the standard of care in general dentistry is still 
the full mouth series of x-rays and bite wings that show very limited information, especially because of the limited x-ray coverage area. I can take the CBCT image, but I might not know what I'm looking at. For those new to CBCT, there will be new anatomical structures never seen before as the coverage area expands. What are the liability issues with failure to diagnose pathology? Now, I'm going to I'm just going to say this and then let each of you close today cuz that's a great way to close. I have never seen more resorption in my life than before I got CBCTs. Mm -hmm. I have never had more of a desire to learn airway and TMJ in addition to Jeff pushing me all these years with getting a CBCT. There's always somebody there to read it, but it's amazing how you will have so much more information because remember 2D limits you on what you can see between the bone and between the surfaces buccolingually of teeth. It's amazing how much more you will see. I personally think it's my standard of care. I understand 2D is still the standard of care, but what's important is, as Sam started today off, what is your standard of care in your practice? That's my thought because those patients are trusting me. Jeff? I agree. So first, I loved what, what Sam said earlier about you get these larger fields of view that are three dimensions. Maybe you're seeing things that you've not seen. So maybe you're sending a high percentage of them off. What a fantastic learning experience that is. I think that was a great point that Sam made. I mean, that's how you learn this stuff. But more importantly, I don't think I've ever seen a dentist get sued for rising above the level of the current standard of care. So I also love the comment, you know, if you're on the sand, they say, well, why did you take the scan? Well, in three dimensions, I can also see periodontal defects. I can also see airway concerns. I can also see if there's a problem with the joint, which will affect the diagnosis on the teeth. You really think there's going to be a jury that says, hey, they're going to that extent, and but they're not reaching the 2D standard of care? No, I, Lou, I know you've done some expert witness work, and, and I've done it as well. I've never seen anybody get in trouble rising above the current level standard of care. Chris? Rising above. You know, to me, there's an analogous term to standard of care. It's called usual and customary. And to me, that's a C. Do yeah. I really want to be a C dentist? No, I'm going to... Your, your word is so accurate, Jeff. I'm going to rise above that standard. I don't want to be a standard dentist. I don't want to be a usual and customary dentist. So I, for me, I need that information in order to rise above. Yeah, thank you. Sam, let's close it up with any final thought before I close. Yeah, you know, I talked about differentiating my office uh, and I'm in a world of uh, tons of dentists and I can throw a rock and hit like three different offices from my office. So um, to me, the, the higher the level I become, the more understanding I have, yeah. the more educated, the better patients come in with the expectations of I'm coming here because you're the one who's going to know a lot of things about what's going on with my mouth. And just to add to Lou's, I've never seen so many failed root canals since I started looking at CBCT. Have you guys ever seen so many of these things where you're just seeing things just breaking down? Like you're like, oh my gosh, okay, this is going to break down soon. This is going to break down soon. But it's that being above, knowing more and understanding more. And like Jeff said, no one's ever going to hold you liable when you've done above and beyond what you should. And don't get discomforted because you will see things when you first start that you don't know. The more scans you look at, the more you will learn and it, it just becomes more comfortable and you'll reach that comfort level. So when, when the next question just came in about the legal ramifications of not diagnosing pathology, I just wanna be clear here. Reviewing teeth and pathology becomes routine reading a scan. Everybody is gonna nod their head. If you're taking a full field of view, Jeff, and it is a 15 by 16, 
and there's a lesion somewhere up in the nose, is a dentist really responsible for seeing that lesion that is bigger than a booger up in the nose or wherever? And, and I would defend any dentist to that because if I'm looking at joints and airway, am I really supposed to be now an ENT surgeon, so to speak, reading this? I mean, you're taking these bigger field of views on a 10 by eight, it's just not gonna happen, but on a 15 by eight or 15 by 16, you're gonna see more. I mean, do you really feel that dentist is responsible if they miss something way up high, Jeff? Can I interrupt with just a question? Yes, Chris. Are we liable to diagnose something that we haven't been trained to right. diagnose? Yeah. That's yeah. the point. That's the point. That is exactly the point. If you know, this happens all the time in oral surgery. We refer a patient for third molars, right? They take a panoramic or they take whatever image and maybe somebody missed MB2 on the, the root canal and there's an endodontic lesion there. Can we sue the oral surgeon now because they didn't catch the missed endodontic lesion on a tooth on the opposite side of the arch? No, you are only expected to see and diagnose what someone with similar training would under the same given circumstances. Yeah. I've never seen a case go any other way and I challenge anyone to bring the legal precedent otherwise. Okay. And I would say this as I close, to any dentist out there that that's their biggest fear of being sued, you are missing the plethora of opportunities of comb beam diagnostics. And as I hand this over to Lisa, first off, Honestly, it's, I know I'm a nerd, but to hang out with the three gents that I've just hung out with on a Friday, gotten to share and learn, I think that's what Catapult Education is all about and why you three are some of the best teachers in the business and so modest at that. Uh, kudos to all of you. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. That's, that's nice. for my eyes. Lisa, I'll let you do our closing so everybody can get their credits and take it away. Thank you guys. Thank Sounds you. Great. Thanks, Lou. You guys.